Well, welcome everybody here to the Martin E. Siegel Theater Center, the Graduate Center CUNY. My name is Frank Henschker. I'm the director of the Siegel uh, Center. Um, it's great to have you all here. It's one of the mm -hmm. first uh, great summer days and thank you for taking the time to be with us. We also welcome our viewers on HowlRound, uh, our great collaborator for over 10 years. It's a nonprofit theater platform that streams, I think, very significant content uh, relating to theater in the Americas and connecting all us in communities throughout um, the country. We bridge academia and professional theater, international and American theater. And so uh, we really do watch the scene. And uh, of course, also European theater, German theater, French, British theater, Japanese theater, countries that are superpowers in some way over hundreds of years of tradition. But also we have from over 40 countries had presentation here. We did over 1000 programs. And in one of the programs some time ago also came Rene Polish, and uh, I think you can see um, the uh, projection here. He is a great uh, German uh, artist in the theater. He uh, studied in Gießen at the uh, theater school, actually also with me. I knew him. He was highly influenced by Andrzej Wirt, Hans Thies Lehmann, and created a unique theater style. I acted in his first plays. I produced his first play on the German stage. And he has been here at the Siegel Center at the time we tried to connect him to a New York theater workshop for logistical reasons. It did not work out. He became the director of the uh, Volksbühne Berlin. For those who know it, it is one of the significant theaters of Europe and for a long time, especially in the Kastoff era where he developed his place. And afterwards, many people think it was the leading theater in Europe, not only given an identity to the city of Berlin, through their uh, PR, through their work, and through the atmosphere they created in theater, and ultimately is about the atmosphere it creates in a room, the connections they did. And there was a local theater really meant for Berlin, never traveling as much as Schaubühne Berlin. And Rene was one of the great um, um, printmakers of that theater. The imprint he left uh, is very, very strong. He, he died suddenly during rehearsals. He had a heart attack and finished the performance and then died in his kitchen, collapsed uh, unexpectedly, a great loss. And um, we should have had him here in New York much earlier. So tonight is a great night where we will honor his legacy. We have with us also the Goethe Institute uh, New York and York Schumacher was a great, great representative also of European culture, German culture here in New York with whom we collaborated for this evening. So we would like to thank the Goethe who also helped to translate uh, some of his plays. We do two plays with Anna Kohler here, I think, in sourcing, and 24 hours are not a day. His great ideal, uh, ideal, ideal was Fassbinder, uh, who he always wanted to match up to, who also was an auteur de théâtre, who, you, who was, I mean, if he couldn't make his films, he just did it in the back room of a local restaurant, and he saw no difference between it and his theater style influenced his films and his films, the theater style. So. It's a great evening, and we have two outlasting original thinkers of New York theater uh, here, of experimental, or what would say, or even of avant-garde uh, theater. It is uh, Matt Gasta from the uh, uh, Research Center, both theater research in Brooklyn, and uh, David Levine, who has been with us many, many times. They both will also talk a little bit. The structure of the evening will be, we will hear two plays. One will be Heidi Ho, and um, the other one will be insourcing uh, people in crappy hotels. It will be out 40 minutes to 50 minutes each. We have, we'll have, just go on. I hope if you feel one play is enough, of course, um, you can go. We will have a discussion afterwards with the directors and the actors uh, and, um, and then a short uh, reception. So again, thank you all for coming. If you have a cell phone, take it out now. It should not, not be, be ringing. And again, thank you for taking the time and coming out here. And now I'm going to ask Matt to talk a little bit about his work and his connection um, and about the play. So, so first of all, thank you, Frank, for, yeah, for the honor of, um, in a sense, reconstructing and bringing to life the, the plays of Rene Polesh and kind of honoring his legacy. For context, um, this is based on our theater space in Greenpoint kind of feeling a little bit like Berlin to some people, David included. Um, it's in an industrial space and I'm a playwright and a director and I write for the people that I work with. I sort of often write plays based around the personalities of the actors that are kind of coming through. Um, and from what I learned, that's a lot like how Renee Polesh wrote and directed and produced theater. 
Um, so my own connection to tonight's events and to the plays is, is not based on any kind of scholarly approach, but on a kind of shared spirit across time that Frank and David were both um, kind enough to notice and to sort of suggest that it, suggest me for. Um, so I'm, I'm excited to be here. I, I'm not an expert on Rene Polish's work, but um, through working on Heidi Ho, the play we've, we're going to present right now, um, I see and feel the connection. I've, I've grown very fond of the play very quickly. Um, and yeah, as a, as a playwright, it always feels good to be in, in, uh, with peers. And so I did know Rene Polesh. Um, I'm sorry that he's gone, but I do feel through working on this play that I'm, I'm working with a peer. So that's been, um, it's been, it's been good. And so just a little bit about the, yeah, our theater company, it's a 40 seat theater. We've been around for a year and a half. It's in a longer sense, we've been around for 10 years, but it, the, the space we have now is, um, a place where you can come, have a beer, have a cigarette on the roof, see a play, talk to the actors afterwards. Um, so I think in a, in a tenuous but real way, it, it captures something of the spirit of maybe the Volksbühne and, and Polesh's work in general across Germany. Um, a little bit about the play we're going to present tonight, Heidi Ho. It's a one act. It's a longer, I could, maybe they're all one acts. I'm not entirely sure, but it's a one act. I'm going to save some time on stage directions. You have to imagine that a massive Mercedes logo is spelled out in cocaine or speed on the floor. Um, three women are, are hanging out in something that maybe are not a, a sh car showroom. Um, and the rest, I think you'll get through the text. We, there's some Beach Boys songs that play, which will demarcate we're not going to play Beach Boys. Um, the rest is really in the text. Um, Tessa, Claire, and Renee and I have been working on the play for 48 hours. We like it. We, we almost, we're talking about wanting to do it. Um, but yeah, so this is just the fruit of like a really fast but really intense kind of mini workshop. And I'm excited to see their work, as I hope you all are. So that's it. Give them the. Are you going to play the Beach Boys? We might also be doing role play. Heidi shows her bicep in the spotlight, making them work so that the little tattoo on them jumps around, effortlessly posing to, is to be hidden or worked against. Nice tattoo. Glad you like it, it's from a home service. If people really do anything, it has to be said. They came into my sitting room with this enormous tattooing machine. It was larger than life. Yeah, it was. This enormous tattooing machine stood in my sitting room and all just to leave behind a pretty picture. And then you had yourself tattooed. Yeah, I picked up this mountain massive from Switzerland. It looks especially pretty when it snows. How big was it? What? The machine. It filled the whole room, yeah, really. And all just for this ridiculous massif. Yeah, really ridiculous. Massively ridiculous. It was larger than life. It was the last tattoo studio before the motorway, but at the same time, they had this home service, so they were somehow on the motorway as well. But not the last. What? Don't press her any farther. But not the last. Yeah, okay, maybe. Maybe they were the last on the motorway. Maybe masses of tattoo studios are racing along the highway, and sometimes it's one, and sometimes it's the other, which is last on the motorway. Heightened conditions of competition. This tattoo studio rolled along the motorway to you at home. Is that what you mean? Yeah, exactly. And left a nice massif on your arm. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> they had to get this enormous thing in here somewhere. That's what they did. I definitely wanted it. What? Uh, this massif from Switzerland, you know, you can see little men who take care of controlled avalanches. The slopes are strewn with grenades to shoot at the avalanches with. Yeah, great. I can see them. Heidi Ho! That's my name. Don't wear it out. Heidi Ho! Heidi Ho! Is this your home? Yeah. Are you sure? I think so. Take a look at it. Yeah. It's a nice room. I always thought, well, I always assumed this is your home, but now that I'm here, I thought we wanted to go home to your place. Yeah, okay. But we did. I work here. This is my home. It looks like a branch of Daimler Chrysler. Yeah, great. It looks like a terminal at Daimler or Chrysler. There are these logos made of Coke lying around everywhere. I work at home. Doing what, exactly? On things. I don't see them. But it works somehow. I'm a customer advisor. The customers are online, but offline I'm at home. She's online. <laughs> Hi, no. She comes from Switzerland and she runs like clockwork. What do you do in your spare time? Yodel and ski. Yeah. Uh, here, of course. Yodel and ski, that's Yodel what your spare time looks like. And that's in home service. The modernization of the workplace is tied up with gender-specific characteristics like closeness to the customer, team capability, home service. And here is the case in point. That sounds like a stereotype female workplace. Whatever. How do you cope? Using new technology. There's this terminal. What terminal? Well, okay, I admit you can't see it properly right now, but there is one. She's online. Stop it. 
Go offline. Go away from this line. When I grow up, I want to drive a garbage truck. Is that the song? Yeah, exactly. Is that the song you wanted to put on? Yeah, exactly. It's by the Ready Maids. Of course, I don't really want to drive a garbage truck. I just wanted to hear it. You just wanted to put it on. You're online. Yeah, all right. But you're not at home. Yes, I am. <laughs> Whatever. Then I'm not. But offline, I'm at home. I'm more motivated since having to spend more time at home and less time in the office. Why? I don't know why, but it motivates me. The whole thing's like a revolution. A social revolution in favor of investment capital. It looks as though Daimler Chrysler's at home here. They are. Somehow. Online, they're at home. It looks like you've gone back to your traditional workplace. Which one? It looks like you've gone back to your kitchen sink or whatever. Yeah, okay, but I haven't. There isn't a kitchen sink here. Yeah, okay. What now? We could get someone to come from the pizza service. According to laws of therodynamics, it might just be that the pizza is then no longer the warmest of pizzas. So what? I like eating cold things which have been traveling a long time. Yeah, okay, but I don't. Then we'll just ring up the therodynamic pizza service, which turns the laws of nature upside down. Whatever, dial the number. There's this scene in Norma Ray where she stands on these cotton spinning machines or weaving looms and holds up a placard with the word union in front of all the female workers gathered there. I wish I could see it now. Norma Ray is a textile worker. She works in textiles. What? She makes them with machines. She spins cotton. You said she stands on these machines. Yeah, okay, but only when she holds up this placard. She tries to organize a union. Otherwise, she sits at these machines. Of course. She works there. You want to see a film? Mighty ho. We wanted to go to the cinema. Norma Ray. The true life story of a textile worker who helped unionize a southern mill. Yeah, great. Unionize the southern mill. She helped organize this union. And it's portrayed somehow out of love for this crazy journalist. The filthy bastard. There was this film team from the East Coast, and they filmed an unsuccessful landing with a model airplane in one of these cotton fields. The cotton flowers were supposed to take on the role of extras. And you could see these white heads into which a transport plane crashed during a flying event. And the cotton field caught fire, and the whole year's harvest was destroyed, and all just to make some shitty damn film. And that was what film? What? And that was what film? Some fucking cheap shit. How do I know what film it was? Some film or other. And to save on some idiotic extras, this cotton field had to believe in it. And Norma Ray organized an uprising against the film, the film company. The company in these films was a flourishing enterprise, although the films were nothing but cheap shit. But the company in the South was not a flourishing enterprise, and Norma Ray wanted to draw attention to this with her placard. What sort of placard? Some placard or other. She worked in this textile mill and helped organize a union, and the film company simply set fire to a cotton field. But the company in Norma Ray was not a flourishing enterprise, so they wanted to organize a strike. It's not about some fucking widow burning. It wasn't a fucking film about widow burning with an idiotic great mercy shot. No, nothing like that. A widow who fell in love with the captain in the fire brigade. It can only be one of those silly wi widow burning films with a fucking happy end. And now I want to go to this cinema. Cinema used to be action spaces. Before the bourgeois way of life asserted itself there. So what? I'm still going to go. We could explode this popcorn machine as a kind of protest against the bourgeois way of life. But popcorn explodes itself. It's its second nature. Popcorn has no second nature. It's its first. Not its first. It's its second. Heidi ho What's this here? A dispenser that you can get cars out of. Smart show tower. We mistook it for a drive-in cinema. But in a drive-in cinema, the cars aren't stacked on top of one another. We took it for a multi-story, a multi-story <laughs> drive-in cinema. Anyway, I thought it was all right. And they're not the same make either. Yeah, okay. Anyway, now we're sitting around in stupid cars not watching a film. Is that right? Have I understood that correctly? We mistook this tower for a drive-in cinema which no longer tells stories. We're sitting in these smarties and we could read a book. Are you crazy? It looks good, but sometimes you've got to go to sleep too. I read 200 books today. Yeah, great. And I smoked 200 cigarettes. That's not quite the same thing. Well, I think it is. I fell asleep at the wheel. Ever. Because somehow there's no film running. Ever look through these windows onto the city. This here was once the busiest square in Europe. Dude, we're not driving anywhere and there's no film running. This here is a filthy damn tower. Just watch something. Yeah, okay. Fucking imbecilic filthy chimney. Yeah, okay. There was a press conference. It was about this imbecilic chimney opening its archives at last. And they were where? On the internet, you moron. It was about money, which someone wanted for work of some sort. I've got that film on tape. Which film? The film you were talking about with Norma Ray? Oh, it was something about a company or a film company and about some flourishing enterprise or other. And a strike by workers or forced laborers. You said this 
bank became hysterical. Yeah, it did. It became hysterical and it had to take something. And that's what it did. It took medicine and legal security from a lawyer or chancellor. It had this mega crisis. The new conditions of competition had made it hysterical. But me too. I am too. Yeah, you are. You're hysterical, but you're not a bank. Economic processes have an effect on spaces and bodies. Yeah, okay, but you're... <laughs> and it had to take something. It had to take medicine or legal security. And it received it? Yeah, it received it. It received pills and legal security from a lawyer or chancellor. It had this mega crisis. It took both together and was shown on the split screen. The new conditions of competition had made it hysterical. You're talking about a hysterical bank. Is that possible? That's very possible. It was about forced labor or the globalization of capital. It became hysterical between forced labor and globalization. Yeah, and there it was also historical. And the new conditions of competition had made it hysterical. Me too, I am too. Yeah, you are, you're hysterical, but you're not a bang. Economic processes have an effect on spaces and bodies. Yeah, okay, but you're not a bang. <laughs> Only I saw this press conference and some spokesman from the bank became hysterical. It was about legal security for the Deutsche Bank. With the onset of globalization and the new conditions of competition, the Deutsche Bank is at present working on its history. The acceleration of businesses by forced labor and this IG Farben consortium. It was hysterical between forced labor and globalization. Yeah, okay, but it was also historical. And then the bank became hysterical. Yeah, shortly afterwards. Besides Besides, hostages were taken, but this stronghold was deserted and it was not a public bank either. So people were taken hostage from the street. It was not a public bank. The capital flowed globally around the world. Still, someone had to take the hostages somehow. So they got them off the street. Hostages were taken from the street? Yeah, exactly. The man holding the hostages had, had made a mistake with the bank for it was not a public bank. So he had to take hostages from the street. He took hostages from the street. There were no customers coming and going. He had to take the hostages in the bank from the street. It was purely a business bank. They had customers, but they were on the telephone. The bank raced virtually across the world. It wasn't easy to rate it. He could have taken the president's hostage, the president of the bank. He could have taken Reuter or Schramm or Gates hostage or some other global superorganism. He took hostages from the street. This bank was not a public bank. They raided this bank, Heidi Ho. We were in this bank, n'est-ce pas, when hostages were taken. Among them an opera singer who wanted to close her account at a cash machine in the street. Somehow she wanted to leave this town. <laughs> this town. Now it was too late for that. She threatened to lose her nerve and he let her do her voice exercises so that she wouldn't become hysterical. But she was so loud and they wanted to lock her in the safe room, but there wasn't one. The place has changed without me noticing somehow. Yeah, great. The place has changed without me noticing. <laughs> you have to admit the whole thing isn't easy for me. No, how could it be? You work here and you're at home here. Where are we here? Uh, home service, I work at home. Then it's not a home service. Then it's domestic work or something, but not home service. You're a housewife and you work here for Mercedes-Benz AG. Housewife outsourcing. But I'm not a housewife. Yeah, okay. In that case, you are one now. The housewife that works for Daimler Chrysler. Economic conditions determine the relationship between the private and the public. So what? I don't housewife. The firm has moved. Moved in with you at home. Outsourced housewife. I'm not. I'm not a housewife. You fucking Calm down, baby. You are a housewife. Where's the kitchen? Yeah, okay, there is one. Only I found the kitchen too big. I had no idea what to do with it. I don't want to spend my life at the kitchen sink, even a big one. You've made it really nice here. Yeah, I know. Yeah, I know. It looks like home and garden in a branch of Daimler Chrysler. Whatever. This here you could call life dreams which were raped by housing planners. This block of flats with a view onto a children's playground. You get pregnant just by looking at it. Yeah, I know. Here I'm at home, but sometimes I'm not sure, and then I'm plagued with self-doubt and depression, and then I wish I managed without these substances. But you take stuff everywhere you go. I don't, and I'm not everywhere either. Yeah, okay, stop flying off the handle. Since when have you lived here? I don't know. It all went so quickly. Since when have you lived here? It all went so quickly. I've got no idea. Just now I was still in an office and then I had to move. Where to? From my office to my home or vice versa. But it is one and the same place. Yeah, okay. It all went very fast. That's why it's called turbo capitalism. These substances trick you into believing you're at home. These substances trick me into believing I'm anywhere at all. In so-called turbo capitalism, things go very fast. And so you're at home in a nanosecond and at your workplace again, home, and then your workplace again. How do you get from one place to the other? by hyperlink on the internet. Where's the kitchen? There used to be one, but I walled it up. It was a terrible sight. The clan which walled up its enemies alive. Yeah, exactly. I thought we wanted to go to the cinema. Where are we? Mercedes showroom. We mistook it for a drive-in cinema. I thought it was a drive-in cinema. Basically, it looks like where you live. Where are we? 
Mercedes showroom. It only looks like a drive-in cinema because there are cars standing around everywhere, but it's a Daimler Chrysler showroom. We wanted to see this union film. Heidi Ho. I'm Heidi Ho. Daimler Norma Ray. We wanted to see Norma Ray. Daimler Chrysler at Potsdamer Platz. This place used to have more traffic than anywhere else in Europe. And we mistook it for a drive-in cinema. No wonder. And the stars above me are courtesy of Daimler Chrysler. Yeah, they are. The cinema's next door. They're both in this super block. Small wonder. How do we get from one to the other? Hyperlinks on the internet. I would like to know now where I am. A revolution is taking place on this piazza in favor of investment capital. So what, what are we doing here? This is Reuters Piazza. Reuters, the news agency? No, Edzard Reuter, the global super organism. Oh, car salesman, and this here is his shop window. We're in Shrimp's drive-in cinema. This drive-in cinema belongs to Daimler Chrysler. Yeah, great, but in drive-in cinemas, you normally look at films, not cars. Look at the cars. You don't look at cars, you look from cars into something else. What then? Film. You look at the film, you want to see cars, you want to see films. You want to see a film? Look at this. An employee of the month was raped, raped in the back of one of those seats. Yeah, great, but the film's running behind me. I want to see a film there at the front. I want to see a film which is running in front of me and not behind my back. I can understand that totally, darling. And now she oh. Something happened in this house in the desert, something with Heidi Ho. What's supposed to have happened? And what house in the desert? This house in the desert, this super block, it dropped over the desert like Las Vegas, and there it was. This piazza was commissioned by Reuter, a global super organism. Heidi Ho was in a wheelchair. She got into a skiing accident, and now she's in a wheelchair. She fell from her skis into a wheelchair, and now she's in it. Who? Heidi Ho! What's your name? It looks terrible. Heidi Ho! Heidi Ho! Oh, there's nothing. You can knock her sideways. Wasn't, wasn't the other woman in this wheelchair? Was her name from Villa Sissiman? The one who couldn't walk? Couldn't from birth. Oh God, Clara! Wasn't she in the thing? My father always used to say, be yourself and you'll get on. That's nice of him. Sometimes I ask myself where he might be and which young thing he's got on his sights right now. What? Was he also in a wheelchair? We all were, the whole family. We're all in wheelchairs. What did you just say about my father? Did I hear that correctly? He used to chase a load of young things. It's nice to have a father who can give one charming kid. A dirty old dog. He was himself. And that was, after all, what he wanted to pass on to you. God, the filthy bastard. I didn't know that, really. Yeah, come on. Calm down and sober up. I am sober. My God, my mother. I didn't know that. I didn't know that. Sober up and talk to your father. Sober, about the whole thing. You're not. And the worst of it is, the young thing wasn't even a day over 12. It's hysterical. One of the oldest conceptions of hysteria is a dehydrated wandering womb in search of water. So what? Your womb is in search of water. Sober! Whatever. Water's too clear for her. She needs dark things. Bourbon or something like that. Something like that's in here. This womb was searching for bourbon, dark water. Yeah, whatever. Uh, then that's what she was doing. It's also so strange. So what? So what? Be yourself and you'll get on. Yeah, okay, I'll try, but the tip's from a psychopath, so you try making the best of it. You said you'd had a happy childhood. The little farm, farm was our home and the little home was our farm, but that was before I heard this about my father, the damn fucking bastard. Try to make the most of his advice and make it your own. I'm trying, you heard me, you filthy bastard! Talking to your father like that. No, no, stop talking to him. He's your father. He cheated on my mother for years, and when we didn't know where he was, he had a load of young things in his sights. You said so yourself. And now I've heard about it for the first time, and I've actually got the right to get uptight. The filthy bastard! <laughs> this here is our fucking little white farm. Here we're at home, and I can say what I like. This fucking little white Ku Klux Klan farm here was once my home. I simply don't know what to say. I always thought your father wasn't a farmer, but a population planner. He was that as well in his way. He raped women. He destroyed our little family population planner. How could it happen? He's just a man. And now they want to throw him out. I saw it on television. They showed this war in Baghdad and how they wanted to throw him out on the very same screen. This family's in mega crisis. Just a moment. You think your father's the president of the United States? Yeah, so? Your father's a population planner and he works for the UN and he's developing your, this vaccination with which they somehow want to attack the overpopulation. That's the name of a people somewhere in Africa. <laughs> You're badly informed there. Her father is president of this Swiss bank and he runs like clockwork. Yeah, this fucking Swiss. <laughs> Don't sober up. I'm sober up. Oh, not even she's got that many fathers. 
you've got fur hanging out of your nose. Yeah, okay. I know. I didn't have a handkerchief, that's all. You've got fur hanging out of your nose. Yeah, okay. But it's not real. It's not real fur. You slaughtered this seal, baby, and you claim it's not real fur? Yeah, I don't slaughter animals. Heidi holds up a placard with the word union on it from Norma Ray. You said this bank became hysterical. Yeah, it did. Is it a public bank? No, it didn't have a public. There were only these green Reuters screens. What soap ran on them? There was this bank, and they had these televisions everywhere and watched Bloomberg's business TV and Reuters finance information, and they had these Friday to Monday fears on the floor of the stock exchange. Yeah, great, but today's Tuesday. They sat in the Deutsche Bank in front of the Reuters screens and watched Japanese soaps, soaps which have access to the sources of worldwide financial information. You said this bank became hysterical. Yes, it did. Is it a public bank? Bank? No, it didn't have a public. There were only these flickering Reuters screens. Japanese soaps ran around in them and couldn't get out, and underneath ran a ticker with shares prices and the Nikkei index. Japan was in a crisis, and they couldn't get out. Then the society in this soap wasn't exactly a flourishing enterprise. Not according to the Nikkei index. It somehow didn't boom anymore. Soap boomed down. Yeah, okay, but not in Japan. Japan was in a crisis. You said it's not a public bank. There wasn't a hostage drama or whatever. A bank was raided and hostages became hysterical. No, certainly not. It became hysterical just like that. It had this fit of hysterics or nervous breakdown and had to take something. During a press conference. And then its spokesman became hysterical. This spokesman for the Deutsche Bank. The market was its second nature and hysteria was its karma and he took something else. Yeah, okay. But they deliver things to your home. What? All sorts of things. They deliver whatever you order to your home. That's why they call it home service. But you were working. You were online, not at home. I wasn't plugged in. I was offline. I was at home unplugged. What did you order? All sorts of things. He came through the door with his suitcase and said he was at home, but I'd misunderstood him for he simply meant he's from home service. With a suitcase? For what purpose? For presentation purposes. He had the products in a pretty suitcase. He called it his product palette. Uh, there was a Tupperware party in your sitting room at which microchips were sold. He opened his suitcase and my sitting room was a shopping center. It happens that fast. And what did you do then? He smoked grass while he showed me his range. What was he selling? Things, things out of his suitcase and he did it very well. It started with espresso cups um, and ended with false passports and we lay high among the espresso cups while he continued his sales patter. We were stoned. My life was a Tupperware party without my knowing it. Perhaps it was. I did have to make the coffee myself and I that I did once or twice, but then I said to him, I'm not a waitress, I live here. I'm not a waitress. You were the hostess. He could have presented his chips somewhere else. Yeah, okay, but I didn't care. I wasn't prepared for a sales event. I said to him, I'm not a waitress. And it does look like it, but I'm the one. I'm dressed. What's the matter with her? Drink. She's hysterical. I don't drink it. I'm not hysterical. Yes, you do. I had two or three of these home service espressos, but I'm not hysterical. Which ones? The ones they made for me during the Tupperware party. She's not sober. Not sober. She has problems with this home service. Which ones? They weren't real problems. Rather, the problems were in her head. These domestic work problems took place in her head. She's hysterical. That's her karma. Some virtual home service or other which took place in her head? Yeah, okay. But I'm <laughs> These people came to her home, people from a home service, and they somehow took over her life while she was working for Daimler Chrysler. You said this bank became hysterical? It didn't become hysterical. It had just had this, this press conference. And yeah, okay, one or two spokesmen became hysterical, but not the whole bank. Did they take anything? Yes, the spokesmen took something, but they spat it out straight out again. It wasn't what they'd ordered. What had they ordered? Tablets, but they were served drinks. And then they were served tablets as well, and they took them with alcohol and became hysterical. Why? It had to do with forced labor and compensation payments. It somehow had to do with money for work. Someone or other wanted money from it. And then the bank became hysterical. Someone or other wanted to be compensated for work. There was a strike in the bank by workers and forced laborers. And this bank was on the way to globalization. And this super bank became hysterical. A consortium of firms under the auspices of IG Farben had accelerated its businesses. And the new conditions of competition demanded they somehow confront the whole thing. 
It was supposed to open its archives. But this bank wasn't at home, it was somewhere else. A bank which races around the world electronically. It was dropped out of a current of capital flowing globally around the world. It wasn't at home, it was somewhere else. It, it had to do with the occupation of communicative spaces. And that's what they were? Yeah, they were occupied. I went to a cinema. Cinema used to be action spaces. Before bourgeois lifestyle asserted itself there. Yeah, exactly. It was a Western. John Wayne sterilized several squaws, which he did in the Valley of Death. He was a kind of cowboy doctor and waged an undeclared war on the natives, which is what people in the West called the overpopulation. Wasn't there a shooting? A filthy bastard! No, there wasn't any shooting. He and his vaccination pistol planned a kind of private genocide on the overpopulation. And what was important to him was the full assertion of bourgeois lifestyle, where the might is right of freedom. <sighs> the only thing missing was the normalization of this state of affairs. These damn fucking bastards. Yeah, okay, girls. Time for a drink. Oh, yeah. I can't bear this shit anymore. Whatever. <laughs> Time to get completely tanked up. Yeah, let's go for a drink. Someone has to do the work here, and who's going to do it if I don't? Okay, yeah, then do it. Do the work. This here is a party at my house, and I'm working. Yeah, okay, what's her name? She keeps holding up these placards. Who does she think she is? Norma Ray. Norma Ray holds up these placards. It's this film with Norma Ray who holds up placards or something of the sort. There's, but there's bound to be something on them. There's, they're not empty placards, definitely not. Heidi Ho or Norma Ray or what's her name? What's it about? It's holding up this placard or Hedda Gobbler or Nora in her fucking doll's house. Placard home. This is a scene out of Norma Ray. And she repeats it constantly. Hedda Gobbler holds up a placard with union on it. Hedda Gobbler or Norma Ray or Heidi Ho. I Okay, get on with it. I really can't cope any longer. I really can't cope any longer! I can't bear all this anymore. She's revolving at home. She really can't cope any longer. That must be advanced psychology, something of the sort. We have that young man to thank for that. Freud. This unusual arrangement of chairs, I believe he fucked Nora or a doll's house. Yeah, great, thanks. Placard, home. Someone caught him putting women's clothes on his prick? Barbie clothes? He fucked a doll's house with them through a hole in the floor, something of the sort. A fat Barbie doll, which did aerobics or step ups, something of the sort, during an earthquake. And then in the end, whose brain splattered onto the ceiling, something of the sort. What kind of doll's house was it? It looked like something out of, like the one in Psycho. Was it an antique? You mean he fucked an antique? That's very possible. It's possible that the doll's house was an antique. That's very possible. Typical way a prick imagines a Barbie, she looks something like Norman Bates' mother, a kind of drag queen from hell, and in the house, like Norman Bates' house, or like the Bates Motel, and it had a car which drew up in front of it, and a horse box. That was amusing in a way. Tin was on Skipper and wanted to go and play tennis with Barbie, actually, only she was amusing herself all the while step-ups and blue face paint and a blue fluid brain. Who caught him? His aunt. <gasps> it ended with Mrs. Mrs. Janet Lee who was personified by a prick taking off her clothes. I can't stand it any longer. I can't stand it any longer! According to analysis of sociological trends, the prick played a single mother, postulates about social subjects supposed to find their expression in the sitting room. Residential planning orients itself around economic and sociopolitical tendencies. Who designed the house? Ultra brutal architects. They designed it and fucked it. Placard, Placard home. home. Have you driven us lad for long enough? Have you driven us lad for long enough? Anyone got some Valium? What? Anyone got some Valium on them? No? No? I've got some penicillin here. How about that? How about some coffee? I don't want any coffee. What? What? I don't want any coffee! What about clearing up? What about that? Yeah, okay, but I don't want any coffee! I'll get you some. I think this room's revolving. Yeah, okay, but it's not a room. So then something else is revolving? Or Mercedes-Benz, AG. Yeah, okay, so then it's revolving. I'll get you some. <laughs> <laughs> Sick of it. I'm fed up. Go on, chuck everything. What? Go on, chuck everything. Heidi throws away the placard. We can watch TV. 
The Society in Soaks is a flourishing enterprise. Yeah, let's do that. Commercial terminology is used in living space. We could watch TV. We could watch soap actors reaching their limits. And how their very substance is regulated by the market. And how they became hysterical. But soaps don't deal with crises in theoretical economic models. They deal with crises in theoretical emotional models. Yeah, great. That's what I need. They're regulated by the market. I can't stand it any longer. I can't stand it any longer. This isn't living. This isn't living. What for? Yeah, okay, but society and soaps is a flourishing enterprise and we're not. So what? They deal with crises in theoretical emotional models and that's what I need! We could watch and neutralize ourselves politically and order ourselves TV dinners from a home service. Yeah, great! Let's do that! Someone could ring this tattoo, home service, and we could watch TV and get ourselves tattooed. Yeah, okay, let's ring it up. Dial its number. And stop drinking! Oh, but I have to drink. I want to see society reaching its limits. And stop drinking! I have to drink! I want to see something! I would at long last like to see someone reaching his limits! Is that so hard to understand? Is that so hard to understand? But she doesn't do that in soaps. What's the matter with her? Norma Ray's not sober. <laughs> What's the matter with her? A mega crisis. She saw these two crises split on a split screen and had this mega crisis. <laughs> She saw this Baghdad Lewinsky crisis simultaneously on a split CNN screen and had this big crisis. Whatever, I don't know. I'd like to see this fucking soap. What do you think? I'd rather go out for a drink, but we could watch this fucking soap too if you really want to. Yeah, okay, I'm game. Game for what? To watch this fucking soap. As far as I'm concerned, I'll watch this fucking soap with you and have my fucking drink later. Yeah, okay. We can watch this soap. But I don't want to miss it again. I don't want to miss this fuck soap again. I don't want to fall asleep again. This is so hard. We're watching the fucking clothes down. Then let's watch your messy. We're sitting around in this thing. And none of the numbers in the jukebox is over two minutes long. Mr. Love wrote that fun, 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 and it was somewhat over two minutes long. Then this fun was a right epic. Fun, fun, fun is in a way Beach Boys War and Peace. What is fun, fun, fun about? Um, <clears throat> In a way... It's about a whore called Barclay. Not Barclay as in the cigarette plot, but as in Barclay and Barclay, this wedding of the two who were so well suited to each other. And then this whore had an abdominal operation after which she didn't look at herself down there for the first few weeks, but a lot of clients did. And then one day she was in a way forced to look at herself down there in order to insert something, but there was nothing there anymore. There was simply nothing to insert anything in. And she wondered why none of her clients had complained. She'd been spreading her legs totally without a means of reproduction. Fun, fun, fun is too short for the saga you're telling there. I'd no sooner press it than it was over. I only hope you know what it looks like down there. That ah. Mm -hmm. Her gynecologist was not a day over 12. He examined her in the station loo. After they'd blown up her doctor in front of this clinic. Freaking <laughs> loaded pigs! She's having a child! Are you sure this jukebox here doesn't race around the sun for 380 days. Yeah, quite sure, love. What was that cigarette flop you were talking about? Fun, fun, fun is about snowboards and woodies and quite definitely not abdominal operations. About means of production in a way, yeah, but not about holes which are suddenly not there anymore. God only knows, placard. <laughs> it's not about snowboards, it's about surfboards. This jukebox sounds like a board. Don't you think? These speakers sound like surfboards. Yeah, okay, California girls. We should go for a drink now. Heidi ho Yeah, that's my name. Don't wear it out. Somehow in this time machine, there is no number over two minutes long. You want to watch us? You want you want songs which last six hours? Then go listen to operas. That's a jukebox. It's not. Operas don't find piazzas in a jukebox. They do. They do. Isn't genetic information nature's direct message? Is an opera of Henry Purcell's which plays in a forest or in a laboratory or cinema. It's performed in front of ears, in nutritive solutions, and sung from bourgeois subject positions. What are they doing there? Who? Oh. The bourgeois subject positions? What are they doing there? They're sitting on fat opera singers. That's a jukebox. It's not. It's thrown it out the window and it's on the road to Amarillo. And what on earth is it doing there? There's a laboratory or cinema. That's where they play operas. God, God I mean, know. It's a Norma Ray played in the southern states of the USA, all right, but not on the coast, not in Miami Beach. And it's definitely no fun sitting around at these weaving looms holding up a board once in a while. 
placard beach boys it wasn't a board it was a placard and norma ray had written union on it which actually means trades union and she had to do that because she couldn't be heard and the looms were so loud and outside they were making this lousy film in which a model airplane wipes out two million cotton pods and norma ray was definitely no number girl announcing the rounds of a strike or something no certainly not she wasn't holding up a surfboard or snowboard rather it was a placard this stuff you rub off lottery numbers i've always had to ask myself what happens to it it's also meaningless. There speaks one who blew up a doctor. That'll do. Yeah, okay. Take part in a streaming contest. Don't pretend the good time this year is the result of an explosion. Yeah, okay. Calm down, baby. Where's Norma Ray now? She's standing around among these looms and good vibrations by the Beach Boys is coming out of the loudspeakers, and she was nervous because of this union she called into being. Sloop, Sloop John B is only over two minutes, 2.53. Barbara Ann's is two seconds over two minutes. They're playing Surf in USA at twice the speed of light. I'd like to see the turntable. Yeah, great. And I'd like to stand on it. You would not. Yeah. Standing behind the glass cage, which is filled with food, in front of the gas glass cage sit sits Axon with her back to it. Invertedly, Bambi slowly creates chaos with, with the result that the case ends up looking like the contents of a stomach. As children, we spent summer at camp together. And she had bulimia or was homesick and cried for three whole weeks. Every day she received a postcard from her dog and cried and vomited and thought her parents had forgotten her. Of course, it was they who had written her as her dog. You don't have to tell everybody about that. You don't have to tell everybody about that. But it's the truth. So what? Of course, she was pleased that her fat dog wrote her a card every day. But what about mommy and daddy? What were they up to the whole time? What were they up to? Hmm? They're up to me. <laughs> yeah, okay. But you weren't to know that at this point in time. You thought you were lonely and all alone and like a kind of Dr. Doolittle who gets posts from house pets. Anyway, she cried and vomited and everything that went with it. And every day her parents dipped her mangy dog paws in black stamp ink and pressed them under the message on the postcard for their ungrateful daughter at camp. <laughs> Part in the screaming contest, a screaming contest for pregnant mother. And one, let's not forget that. What's that? Glass case Belima. Why is it called that? Some silly model or other helps herself from it, and then there were incidents. Which incidents? Don't press her any further. She had bulimia, or was homesick and carried the camp food around with her on her clothes. And then later, when she grew up, she worked as a table in a sushi restaurant, and old men played around with their food on her. She laid around in this restaurant, they pulled up chairs around her, and then you could eat off of her. Well, it's better than carrying trays all over the place. Fine, but I thought she was a waitress. I didn't know she works as a table. I'm not a waitress. She's not a waitress. She works as a table. Someone or other here is a waitress and doesn't know it. Yeah, okay, but it's not me. Someone or other is responsible for this glass case or these stomach contents and doesn't know it. I'm responsible for the stomach contents, but otherwise I know nothing. Since being at this camp, she carries her food around with her on the outside as a sort of outer skeleton. It seems to stabilize her somehow. She worked in a restaurant with no tables and then she was one. To be honest, I can't bear watching you magic raw fish out of your dress anymore. Everybody, what's the matter with you? Did you moan as much as a table? You're not lying around in restaurants anymore, which is, after all, a step in the right direction. If she gets any seaweed out from under her armpits, I'm going to throw up on the spot. I want to have a baby. You lie every evening under three kilos of raw fish. I wonder how you think you're ever going to find a husband. At best, you can only give birth to caviar. A table taking part in a screaming contest. This table's pregnant. So <laughs> what? You're hysterical. I'm not. She's taking part in a screaming contest. A screaming contest for pregnant mothers. Yeah, okay, but Japan's in a crisis, too. Who? Japan! Screaming! Freaked out no actor. She took part in this screaming contest for pregnant mothers, screamed Japan the whole time, and got this crisis. Then? And then they gave her tranquilizers. She screamed and screamed and was totally relaxed, but the children in her throat were somehow allergic to these pharmaceutical products and got crippled, uh, what do you call them, uh, hands or something or other, and that was it. Shut your face! She runs around with sushi under her armpits or with a coffee machine, and I ask myself, do I have to stand the sight of it any longer? Yeah, okay. I was here at home, but there were also these people from the home service. Who did what? All sorts of things. I was online, and the people from the home service took over the homework or had these sales events. In your home? Of course in my home. There was this sales party, and I was online, not at home. There were friends there, and they were buying all the stuff, and I was somehow outside. I wasn't really present, so I thought I could make my flat available for these kind of events. Which kinds of events? These sales events. I thought I'm virtually out. Why shouldn't someone from the home service feel at home here? Someone or other's living my life. 
someone or others living my damn life and it's not me. Perhaps someone from the home service. Yeah, perhaps someone from them. Why didn't you just go? I couldn't. I was tied to the house, okay? Why didn't you just go? Multitasking. I can get everything done at home, but it also fulfills me. My life is filled full. But it's not yours. No. No, no, it's not. You're right. It's not. She had a life filled full and it's not hers. <laughs> God! On home shopping programs, people often shake their heads in disbelief. That only happens, however, in order to draw attention to the advantageous prices. It must on no account happen for any other reason. That would just about be the end. I can understand that very well. The end of what? The end of everything, baby! No, he didn't live here. It was just someone from the home service. What was he selling? Mascara and microchips. No, it was just someone from the home service. Sometimes I ask myself what's the meaning of this whole business. Profit, most likely. But there must be more to it than that. There must be more to it than that. I was only, well, I thought I was here at home, but now the matter looks entirely different. In what way? I thought I was offline at home, but now it looks as though this home service exists offline. Yeah, so? And if I'm not online, I'm offline at a Tupperware party. You'll have to live with that, darling. I'm offline at a Tupperware party. We all are. Yeah, okay, but it's just that I once specialized in things and now I'm a housewife. Yeah, then you're now a specialist in being at home. Oh, I'm not at home. Music, record. Home service union. You can't jump up from your computer and shout for the union. Why not? You hold up this placard, but... No one can see you. She had her father's car and drove it to this burger drive-in and had lots of fun. Her father's taken the car away from her. What are they singing? Fan, fan, fan of the drive-in clan. They're singing fun, fun, fun. And daddy's taken the car away from her. The bastard. Heidi ho. I don't believe it. I don't believe it. What's happened? You swung her out. Well, I never did know for sure if I wasn't going to be fired at the end of a working day. It was very possible. But why now of all times? This work is a cliffhanger. Yeah, it is. It's kind of a cliffhanger. It's like the soap operas, albeit without the flourishing enterprise. She lived in a soap opera. She has this flourishing enterprise on her terminal, and it's thrown her out. I asked myself how it came to be so widely accepted that the market can control our lives. Can you tell me that? Can you tell me that? No, I can't. Yeah, okay, the free market model does seem to satisfy a need. The question is which one? No, not actually. I don't know which one. I asked myself who installed the myth that the market could control your lives. I'd like to get my hands on them, these damn fucking bastards. She looks really serious about it this time. Yeah, that's it. That's it! She's never been so serious. I'm serious. And now I want to go to the cinema. <laughs> we could explode popcorn. The popcorn's been exploded already under the watchful eye of this nice lady behind the counter and you can't do a thing about it. She's got this popcorn accelerator on the counter and it explodes and after all, that's popcorn's second nature. Popcorn doesn't have a second nature, it's its first. Heidi Ho, don't press her further. What's she been doing all night? Experimenting with popcorn. What's there left to discover after all the achievements in this area are impressive enough. There used to be funeral directors who experimented with popcorn. The aim was to build coffins, which disintegrated into thin air as quickly as possible possible. No wonder with the shortage of ground space. They registered the patent with the cushion which breaks down into components out only after a few weeks. They filled it with popcorn. However, the heat produced during the rotting process made some of the corn explode after it was in the grave and several corpses were exhumed because they thought that they were panicking and sending knocking signals. During Sunday visits to the cemetery, deeply moving scenes were enacted. To say nothing of the uproar when a few of these coffins were creamy. We could blow up that cinema. The popcorn reminds me of something. What? The cotton pods floating down the Jordan because someone or other had to make a lousy film. This popcorn's what's left of the cinema which was blown up. You must get that into your head. This here is a cinema or a smart show tower and the employer of the month distributes popcorn and his glasses are demolished. The popcorn or particle accelerator is looked after by this nice lady. It does look like a particle accelerator. That's what it is in a way, only it doesn't produce antimatter. It produces popcorn second nature instead. She's hysterical. Hi, Heidi Ho. Heidi Ho has fun, fun, fun with this popcorn machine till her daddy took the T-boat away.
She fell asleep. Yeah, great. Stop screaming. IG Farben or FRG Firm Consortium turned up and the party developed into a sort of screaming contest. Miss the fucking soap yet again. So what? There's no reason to scream the place down. None of which we're seeing the right stag racing around the world. The Society in Soaps is a hysterical enterprise. He doesn't want to see the right stag. <laughs> then look at your messy. What's your name? Heidi Ho. Yeah. Heidi Ho, that's my name. It's okay. okay. It's not that exciting. Heidi Ho. Heidi Ho. Yeah. Great. Thanks. Scream is fire. Sophia, here. I guess, yeah. Can I give you a suggestion? Yeah, it's fire. Frank, can we have two colors of blue? Do we have time for like a two minute break? Yeah, that's your choice of color. I was going to the back. Yeah. Yes. Two or three minute break and then we, we uh, start again. Really? Oh, yeah, right. There's nowhere to hook it. Hey, George, I'm doing great right now. <laughs> No. Yeah. Mm -hmm. This is Fred, you know? Directly, I like am in the projection. I want to tell you this bar. Mm -hmm. 
It's you look perfect. Yeah, sure. Okay, so now we come to um, the second reading, and David will talk a little bit up front. Yeah. Um, Hi, thanks. That was that was that was great. Cast, cast of the first one. Um, okay, so I a little yeah a little bit of um background so i was a theater director in new york in the mid-aughts and i was working uptown and i was working downtown and i was kind of hitting a dead end artistically um and frank was sort of trying to help me out of it a little bit um <laughs> but i wound up in berlin and by accident on my second night there uh, a friend took me to see a play at folksbühne called 24 hours don't make a day uh which was a Polish play and I did not understand a word of German um at that point uh but it completely changed my life and I suddenly understood I suddenly understood like what was wrong with the theater I was making what was wrong with the theater I was seeing um and this idea that people could get the, and you see you saw it in the first play if you've never heard his plays like people getting this upset about ideas or people getting this upset about not being able to formulate a clear idea about the situation that they're stuck in and the way that the audience reacted and the way it seemed incredibly local, um, it seemed like just for the audience that was seeing it um, and not trying to communicate beyond that. And I was just like, oh, right. And so paradoxically, uh, seeing Polish's theater drove me out of theater because I realized you just can't do that in America because um, that's just not what we do with theater. So that actually, so then I just sort of shifted everything I did and started doing it in museums where I could do more stuff than, that I kind of wanted and incorporate some of the stuff that I that I learned from him. So yeah, so Rene Polesh uh, drove me out of the theater and, uh, and I was very happy out of the theater doing my shit. Uh, and then I accidentally happened upon uh, the Brooklyn Center for Theater Research because I had a friend in the show. And the kind of show it was was incredibly naturalistic, like deeply, deeply, deeply naturalistic. But the vibe in the room felt exactly like the vibe at Folksbühne, which never felt like you were actually crossing a border. And I mean, alone among the theaters in Berlin, going to the theater at Folksbühne never felt like a special occasion. It never felt like you had to get dressed up. It never felt like the theater was dressed up. There was a continuity between the street and the lobby and the theater. It was just one big room. Nothing was ever over rehearsed. Nothing was ever labored. Um, it was just very loose and yet like spectacularly funny. <laughs> and so I went to see uh, Dime Square at Brooklyn Center for Theater Research. And whatever you thought about the play, the room itself felt exactly the same. It was just incredibly loose and it felt like it was theater being made for a specific audience, uh, not over rehearsed, very relaxed. And I was like, right, right, this was actually the vibe that I was looking for and um, that you cannot recreate in American theater, although you could recreate it in an art gallery, which is what I had been doing. But then I was like, oh yeah, you actually can do it in theater. Thank you, Brooklyn Center for Theater Research. So, um, so yeah, so then I was lucky enough to start working with these guys because it was a kind of approach to theater that I could really believe in. Um, and so here we find ourselves, uh, all of us together. Uh, so I saw a lot of Polesh's plays, and the I just want to say, so Heidi Ho, I think, was written in the late 90s or early aughts, and it's his, it's Polish's first big hit. It's before he goes to Folksbühne. And, um, and the play you're about to hear, Insourcing, is written, I think, just two or three years later, uh, at which point he kind of hits firmly his mature style, which, um, be warned, involves even more yelling. Um, and <laughs> Naya, uh, um, 
but it's actually significant that these are set when they're set and it has a lot of the same concerns and even some of the same text so um and you'll hear i mean you'll hear some of the text almost repeating itself but concerns about like the nature of home concerns about the nature of work and this is all happening while berlin is very rapidly changing um and just getting flooded with american style capitalism and also american style internet labor and obviously there's tons of shifts going on in the city of berlin involving housing once all these western kids start moving into the east and like and once eastern europeans start being treated like migrants crossing to the west um so it's an incredibly unsettled time and the internet is unsettling things even more and you can see and you can see all these like what is the difference between home and work work and home what the fuck am i doing and all of these concerns are kind of in both of these plays in sourcing um and the sets are also really specific because the sets were generally built by this guy Bert Neumann and they're really specific kind of environments that evoke a lot of things. So just as in just as in um, Heidi Ho, they're kind of in a Daimler Chrysler showroom, which is kind of a coke den, which is kind of Heidi's house. Uh, in this case, they're kind of in a hotel, kind of, which is designed to feel like home. And this was, again, like very historically specific to a moment of like a certain kind of like work hotel that they were trying to pioneer in Berlin, which made you feel like home, therefore it eliminated all the things that make a hotel a hotel. So these people, as in Heidi Ho, are just partially just trying to figure out where the hell they are and what kind of work they're doing. Um, the cast, as often in this period, is um, three women. Um, we could only round up two, so George, George is, we're signifying a woman here with George Olesky. Um, and, um, and there is the occasional stage direction. The, I mean, his stuff was often punctuated by music clips or by weird interludes, or in this case, by video clips. Um, I did not see insourcing, and both the German and the English script just say clipped. So I will occasionally read the word clips, which will signify a scene break, I guess. Um, and I think that is all I need to say. Um, Sophia Engelsberg, George Oleski, Izzy Marr uh, will, be, uh, will be the subjects of capitalism in this interlude. And uh, yeah, I think we're good. Thanks, Frank. Here reminds me of home. Now that's a service. Being reminded of something. But what? And what is home anyway? What is this place? A hotel. There's a product home, and it's here in this hotel. Insourcing being at home. This hotel is producing home nets. This furniture looks really crap, but everything else is attractive. Everything you can't see. All the services provided here are somehow attractive. <laughs> everything you can't see here is attractive. Reminders of home. Okay, but is it producing an idea of being at home here? How is it doing it? I've got a personal relationship with you, and that's why it feels like home. Shut up! I want to find my home with you. Yeah, great, but I don't! Fuck, I don't! These social conflicts. On the housing front, 2004. You're in this hotel room, and you're looking for the minibar, only there isn't one. Bummer! Just like home. The rooms in this hotel don't look like hotel rooms. And where's the fucking foyer gone? Suddenly, there's nothing left in these hotels that I associate with hotels. It's more like what I imagine home being. Home as a service. I'm here in this hotel, and work and life keep dissolving into each other. Like at home. And you can find a home here with people who work here. Home for people who work here. Because a home can only be created for someone. The hotel relies on active participation of its clients to achieve their feeling of being at home through, among other things, their personal relations with the staff. So a home is being produced here, and you need to do your bit. Service alone cannot make up for having a home. If it's going to produce a sense of home, your hotel needs you to work for it. If you want to achieve that, a sense of being at home, you've got to work at this factory too. Okay, that's what I'm doing. I love everyone who works in this hotel. Love hotel. And they love me or they respect me socially. I know that. I'm not just sure what they're doing! Whether they love me or whether they're just producing some said personal involvement, that's real. Some sort of cash down involvement, which is real, or something on a credit card, which is real. And this, this is where the mini bar always used to be. Where's it gone? Or the foyer. There used to be a foyer in this hotel where you could just show yourself off. What happened to it? 
What's happened to fucking showing yourself off? They're trying to cut back on it. You can only show yourself off in your room now. <laughs> this hotel is offering home as a product. That makes this a factory. For emotions and stuff and interaction and things. So this is a factory Between for Between the guests and the employees of this cleaning service in this hotel whose job it is to produce home. The woman from the cleaning service needs you to work with her to achieve an intimate relationship so that a feeling of home can be achieved inside this for-profit hotel. To produce a home, you're gonna have to work, you fucking hotel guests. So home is being insourced while the housework is being outsourced. It's not just something I have to do. And that's why I like being here in this hotel. Housework's just not something I have to do, or only if I want to preserve the illusion of being at home, then that's my contribution to the production of home. I could be grumpy without tidying anything up. I enjoy personal attention for money without any emotional investment. Without any emotional investment! There's just no need for me to have any emotional investment! Yeah, yeah, shut up. Not with this home staff. Go on, be grumpy then. That's a kind of emotional investment too. But it doesn't involve so much effort! In hotels, there's normally a formalized structure of services and charges, but here, in the home factory, you can enhance the services you receive as the notion that you deserve these things because you're good and successful at work. In this hotel, which produces home, talking to the guests should never seem like paid work. It only fulfills the requirements where there seems to be personal empathy or when there is! Everything here is real and paid for! In this factory, which makes home, paid work has to seem like personal empathy. And who's gonna check up on this? The Blade Runner. Some android catcher checks whether your personal empathy with the guests here in this hotel is real! Okay, right, then let's get the Blade Runner or head of personnel down here and see whether the emotion I'm performing here is real or not. Performed emotion that's real. Perform forms of work which require quality usually ascribed to personality and subjectivity. And that's doubly productive. On the one hand, they create profit, and on the other, they reinforce social norms regarding gender and sexual orientation. Perform reinforcement. I love you! And now I want you to make a home with me here in this hotel. Everything here reminds me of home. There's no mini bar and those real feelings of yours. It all reminds me of something. Home or whatever, or what there used to be. I've just got to stop thinking about this place being a factory for feelings, that I'm finding love here in a factory for feelings. In this fabricated home, I just don't want to think about it. And then there's, and then, and then it's good that it's only seemingly apparent. This fabricated love. I just don't want to know that love is being produced here through for-profit social practices. I just don't want to know. All I want to, all I want to do is love you in this fabrication of home and forget that I'm paying for all this for love, for being able to have a relationship with you in this factory of feelings here. A home is being produced here in this hotel. This factor reminds me of home or of my relationship with you and how I achieve that. And it reveals how we fabricate home at home, just like it gets fabricated here. The way feelings are fabricated here, I've got to ask myself, how do we fabricate <laughs> Home offers you a pleasing exclusivity. And that's linked with social status. And everything else is outside. And home and safety and order are linked with social status. The construction of home as a place exclusively for the family of heterosexual order and ethnic allegiance is one of the means of establishing norms. And what principles do a company that's insourcing at home follow? Capitalism! Of course. The personal services in this hotel resemble the personal relationships at home. And if this hotel is a factory which manufactures empathy, then I've got to ask, even though it's apparently just a matter of living and bonding, how the production processes in this hotel affect the way its residents and employees live their lives. That's interesting. How this home factory changes the way you live your life. That's something I've got to be allowed to ask. Then ask, but I don't feel like I live in a factory. <laughs> You're manufacturing empathy. But it doesn't. I thought I just did. Eat some emotion shit. People live here and work here in this home hotel. Empathy is a service, and that's a process I'm interested in. I mean, I mean, I mean, this Blade Runner here keeps asking, uh, keeps on asking you all the time whether the feelings you're producing are real. And precisely because they're real, it's interesting that they're being produced here. <laughs> I don't seem to have one anymore. There used to be something. There used to be someone who was always waiting for me at home. Was that it? What that it? There used to be someone there or kids. Shit like that somehow producing feelings, some kind of empathy in my fucking life. Was that what it was? Was this child of love or empathy in my fucking life? In my own private Idaho. Was I ever there at home in my... <laughs> Well, 
okay, there, those weren't any kind of experiments with the everyday letting kids produce things at home. That's really conventional somehow. But what else are they supposed to do, my kids? Except produce things. They <laughs> So what? I don't want to think about home. Oh, oh. Damn it. I'd rather think about home. Oh, I'm not stopping you. Which social practices are meant to create an impression of home here in this hotel? And do they help undermine heterosexual norms? Now that would really be something new! Shit! That would really be something new! A gay hotel! AOL or LSD hotel? In this AOL hotel, I can plug in my laptop, which then lives there, and I can work on it. And I can plug in LSD or take AOL, and I don't really know anymore! This is where your laptop lives, and it feels really happy in this standard luxury film. And although it's connected with various different online workers, it enjoys the soothing influence of pleasing exclusivity. In this hotel. The soothing influence of a pleasing detachment. Which is linked with social status while demonizing groups and unsafe lifestyles. Living in groups has cost-saving advantages, however, these are limited by other social considerations. For example, the desire for exclusivity. Why should I take part in the street battles <laughs> When exclusivity has so much higher social status! Group living is connected with an unsafe fucking lifestyle. There's this hotel, and people don't just stay there, they work there too, all of them. In this hotel, which looks like an office building, and where you can sell your subjectivity using a laptop, and write emails to your coworkers or your clients if you're a whore! <laughs> or to coworkers and other slaves if you're a whore! And it offers all the services that enable you to work in this hotel. The furniture looks really crap, but everything else it offers is really attractive. Everything you can't see. In this factory, which manufactures a sense of being at home. All the services here are somehow attractive and real. They're also real! The feelings I'm confronted with in the empathy! <laughs> I'm in this hotel and life and work keep dissolving into each other. Everyone works there in this hotel and they plug in their laptops in these AOL hotels. Although the hotel offers or manufactures a home, everyone works here. Insourcing work and home in hotels. There are all these managers working in management suites and secretaries in secretary hotels, but the mobility of garbage men isn't so highly valued, so they don't have hotels of their own. <laughs> they just keep driving around in their massive garbage truck! And you work there too, in this hotel. And everything's furnished in this nice colonial style, so I can have a pleasant atmosphere for writing at my desk! Fuck! There's this product at home, and that's what you're living now in this hotel. Insourcing at home. There's this factory that looks like a hotel, and uh, it makes a product called at home. <laughs> I don't have to be a manager to hire the manager suite. The suite's just called that. The suites were all named after the top floors of Berylsman Building in Manhattan, for example. And offer exclusivity! The suites in this hotel are all named after prize jobs. And are called manager suite and chief executive suite and stuff. They sound like where the boss works. Hotel <laughs> rooms that sound like where the boss works. And you can live, <laughs> live a prized life in suites that sound like something. And basically this building looks just like the Burlesman building in Manhattan, for example, only there are migrants who clean up the windows up there and they don't offer you a sense of being at home. Neither do the whores in your coffee break. You only get that at this hotel. You can either sell your body in the Berylsman building in Manhattan between two meetings with some fucking CEO, you whore, or throw it away. Throw away your body over this city full of prey. Speculate with your own concern. One lot of prey throwing itself on top of another. Throw away your concern. And all your body reminds you of is profit. Free our body from the profit. Or the thing that consigns you to what set cleaning buildings, you migrant, and you clean the buildings there. Hotels, and you hang around outside windows looking like a broken window pane up there at Bertelsman. On one of the top floors of high technology, you look inside and there are people lying around in sleeping bags, and they're all these standard pleasure model replicants, or migrants, like in Blade Runner. And they work as whores. There are all of these whores and gigolos. From Eastern Europe or wherever, and they're getting the Western lifestyle transplanted into their social display, or theirs cut out of, for something in the Bertelsman building. The Western lifestyle is a sort of cutting of your face! Shit! That's where they're getting all their lifestyles cut away out of their fucking faces and having something re-implanted. Some kind of deregulated neoliberal lifestyle. Shit! That you get transplanted into your face and somehow it looks Western! Speculate with your body! In Manhattan! They work there in the Bertelsmen on the top floors, the whores or the replicants. And you can ring them up and then they lie around. In sleeping bags. And Bertelsmen fucks them. I don't have... <laughs> half. To be a manager to hire the manager suite, I could just as well be a whore. I just mustn't look like shit! Then I won't insert the...
myself that I've been offered. It's like being at home, this hotel, and whoever you bring back with you is treated as if they're your lover, even whores. All these feelings I have, it's all just service. This hotel produces manageredness as an attractive <laughs> potential identity, or being successful and mobile. And then, <clears throat> and then you get what you deserve, a home where you have high status. This company delivers you a home where you are something. This hotel produces mobility as an attractive potential identity, and everyone respects you because you're so mobile, but you also have an entitlement to a home. You're at home in your mobility. Yeah, right, but you're also entitled to a home distinct from mobility. These are offers to a possible self that is, however, always working and never has any time for a self. But this home offers you the possibility of some self, and that is something. There used to be more than these boundary dissolve. There used to be more than these boundary dissolving between life and work and sex and business or left. I'm not sure anymore. But everything's getting mixed up inside of this shit. Everything's getting mixed up here, and now this shit is looking for a home here. This shit where everything's getting mixed up and this factory here is interested in producing home that's part of the economy, but shit. Here, it's looking for a home. No, shit. The shit here is looking for economy. True. I've seen this potential identity, woman in management. It was being produced in my hotel room. I walked into this colonially furnished crap, and it was standing there being a possible self, and I began to scream. What? <laughs> Jesus, is today Friday the 13th? There were all these managers in the hotel. Although I was in the manager suite, I hadn't expected me to be a manager in there. You met your own possible self? That's always horrible. And of course, we're expected to fit perfectly into this world of managers. There were all these potential identities of women in management in this hotel, and they all began to scream. What? Numbers between one and a million. Men and woman managers screaming their lungs out on the trading floor or in the manager suite. It's the only way they can afford a Porsche. Men and women managers. What is it? They were screaming their lungs out. And they were screaming contest on Wall Street and in the Deutsche Bank and in the Bertelsmann building. They all scream like that on Wall Street. It's the only way they can afford a Porsche. Scream on Wall Street! I want a Porsche! I move in here, then what this hotel room offers me is the image of a manager, highly paid and very busy, traveling with her suitcases on wheels. I don't get talked to in this hotel like a wife or a mother who's having a holiday from the shit at home. Nobody has holidays here. They just carry on working without anything in between. They just keep on screaming here and without ever taking a holiday. Holiday in a work hotel. Mobility is highly respected. And that desk there in the office suite hotel is no good for kids. I mean, they can't change nappies and stuff on it. Change nappies on your desk. And then they're also horribly mobile. It's not my fault, but my kids are all somehow hyperactive. Hyperactive and highly mobile. Mobility is highly respected. Yeah, but not on top of my desk. Then you've got your mobile laptop and this hyperactive child there on top of your desk. But somehow there just aren't any opportunities for changing the things nappy in the manager suite, where they aren't very frequent. There just aren't any opportunities. Oh God, all these children with no nappies. It's not a changing table, the desk in your manager suite. What you have there is the opportunity to run a business from the hotel, and the desk isn't for changing nappies, it's for work. As part of the economy and not as part of this baby shit. I can change a nappy and I can type stuff into my laptop. I can. But you're not concentrating on your business. While well, you're looking at your unnappy children. I didn't say unhappy. They might not have nappy sometimes or love or whatever. Shit! But they are definitely not unhappy. Unhappy management. All right, I'm high of the management suite, but that doesn't mean my kids are unhappy. I mean, unnappy. I mean, how did God know nappies on? Shit! And it's already starting getting confusing with mobile leadership and laptops and hyperactive kids there on top of your desk. Shut up! I've got to put the fucking nappies on somewhere. There's a bed next to your desk. Use that. Use the fucking bed next to your fucking desk. Well, they are my children, and they have been produced entirely heterosexually, and I've got to tack on these means of capitalist production methods to somebody. These hetero-capitalist production methods off a sweet hotel. Well, I've never heard of a hotel that was only for changing nappies. It's just not something work hotels offer. <laughs> You're running around this hotel with your hyperactive babies looking for a table to change nappies on. That is not useful. Fuck! This, the means for manufacturing normality are exclusivity and stuff like that. And not these sudden outbreaks of overpopulation and communal living, which disturb the boundaries which go hand in hand with luxury in this hotel. 
They would never have let you have the manager suite if they'd known about your hyperactive babies. This behavior translating into values destabilizes this hotel. Your behavior translated into values! And that's how the social slide begins. You might as well smash all the windows. We're not living with the hot and pots here! Running around the hotel with a baby and smashing windows are two entirely different things. We're not living with the hot and pots here or at your house. Third world hotel! It smells of overpopulation. All those babies in the house. It Clashes with the pleasant colonial style atmosphere here. Sure. And after all, there's a conference here at the World Health Organization dealing with overpopulation. They're working here on a solution for overpopulation, and they're assuming that it's going to happen in the southern hemisphere. What are they going to say? A conference of population planners where they ended up sexually harassing the women from the cleaning service. One woman from the cleaning service was raped by a population planner from the WHO. Someone must have misunderstood empathy there. And the service in this hotel. This World Health Population Planning Organization is having a conference in this hotel. And now blow them away. And it has an un and it has started an undeclared war against an African tribe they call overpopulation. They make speeches about inoculation guns that could be used against the Southern Hemisphere. Like their population policy should be controlled by the industrialized colonies. The guns are loaded with medicines and they prevent pregnancy for five years. They're preparing a kind of genocide. Against overpopulation. In Africa. Overpopulation is to be eliminated. Shit! Someone here wants to eliminate overpopulation? <laughs> but I'm so attached to it! It's all about the uniform-like imposition of bourgeois lifestyles everywhere out there. The only thing missing is a, standard of, a standardization of conditions. The USA has exported its exclusivity around the world. Somebody here wants to eliminate overpopulation. The World Health Organization. And now that's being introduced into the overcrowded cities. This genocide against overpopulation is going to be used on cities. This shit WHO genocide suddenly is going to be used on cities. The only thing missing is a standardization of conditions through exclusivity. And this genocide in favor of exclusivity is used in cities. Things like home and exclusivity are being used in the city here. Good. They watch TV. But now, what's on TV? What's on the hotel TV? What is there on the fucking home hotel television? And hey, did you touch my thermostat? Always me. Swear. All right. You fuckhead! I swear. I swear. I swear. All right, so there's kind of a fake flicker in your eyes. And would you please stop taking that stuff? Would you please stop emptying the minibar which isn't here in this home hotel? Will you stop it? Will you please stop it? And will you sit down again? Sit back down. And now you're going to tell me, are your <laughs> Yeah, right. Tell me that you love me. I love you, little bro. But what's on TV? <laughs> oh, that squaw that used to be called John Wayne. Warner, Warner Brothers made him into a girl. What'd they do that for? They were all brothers and they wanted a girl. Warner Brothers wanted a sister. So they made John Wayne a girl. If you look really close, John Wayne might be a bit like a girl. Maybe. Hey, there was this Western and- John Wayne looked like a girl. And then when we came out of the cinema, we tried to copy him. We behaved like girls. And then John Wayne got all hysterical. He had a revolver, which he called his beauty. The introversion of the libido. This fat squaw had a fit of rage. And then he committed- Ritualized suicide. That's right. It was a Western. John, Wace, John Wayne sterilized loads of squad in, in Death Valley of all places. He was a kind of cowboy doctor carrying out an undeclared war against indigenous populations who in the Western were called overpopulation. Wasn't there any shooting? No, there wasn't any shooting. He and his inoculation gun were planning a kind of private genocide on the overpopulation. For him, it was all about uniform imposition of bourgeois lifestyles or the law of the deregulated jungle. The only thing that was missing was a standardization of, colon of conditions. These damned fuckheads. Those damned fuckheads! I'm happy if there's no one looking after me. And if in this hotel, nobody does. All they do is manufacture something like home. And thank God nobody takes care of me! Here in this hotel, I'm living in my own private, um, Idaho. And in this hotel, I somehow feel more private because I'm forced to think a bit like when I'm at home. This factory manufactures home. And it's only women working here to produce this home. And they're sort of like your wives. The woman working in reception is like a wife. I can give her faxes that she can then fax. The skank. So she faxes them off and suddenly it's like, in this hotel, I'm married to a woman. But your other relationships are heterosexual. Yeah, sure, but not in this hotel. Here I have same-sex relationships with the hotel wife. It's not just home that's being insourced here, but also gender differences. So you've got a homosexual relationship with the concierge in this building? Isn't that great? A home away from this hetero crap! Yeah, sure, thanks. It is great. But I wonder whether homosexuality that's produced by capitalism is what I want to live. Mm -hmm. Sexuality that is capitalist product, whereas capitalist production is usually oriented toward the norm of heterosexual order, ethnic allegiance, and high social status exclusivity. Here in this hotel, 
it's still only the heteronorms moving in, even if my <laughs> is a woman and same sex relationships and personal empathy are produced between women who work here and live in their hotel rooms and women who work here in service jobs. In other words, blah, shit. Suddenly I was standing around in this hotel with no foyer and what grabbed my attention was the offer of accommodation, which created a home. <laughs> a factory for homes. Naturally, I assumed that heteronormality would move in and be insourced here, but I was confused right at the start by a same-sex concierge who performed my wife. Women perform personal feelings here. Finding and furnishing a fucking flat is such hard work. And I don't want to keep having the feeling I'm not here. I'm in some kind of hotel. I'm only ever on the move. So I gratefully accepted the offer of a home. Yeah, take it. All right, I might not be able to stand the furniture. It's just too colonial for my taste, but this home idea has captured my emotions. <laughs> even though the furniture is crap, this manufactured home has captured me! But I don't even look at that anymore. I find everything I can't see here so attractive that the rest no longer bothers me. The furniture, by world standards, doesn't irritate me at all. Okay, so it's all furnished in order not to irritate people, but that's why all these hotels look the same, so they won't irritate me. But always lying around in the same rooms, whether they're in Tokyo or New York, as a high-status woman in management, <laughs> always with the same furniture and the same jet lag, that is kind of irritating. I've always got the same backdrop, and I'm always tired, but I no longer even notice that I've been traveling. I just lie around in some room or the other, and all I can feel is jet lag. Experienced home as a product hand tailored to fit you. And your new circumstances. All my needs are satisfied here, and it's not just fucking hard work as being at home with you at home, so I prefer being at home in this hotel. With you! But you're not. You're at home with a man. You think you're with a woman because you've been using this hotel, but in your proper home, you've got to live heterosexuality. You have to live heterosexually. You do. I see. You piece of shit. <laughs> but being at home is such... SUCH HARD WORK! I'd much rather be at home with you in a hotel. But you're not. I see. <laughs> the head of personnel in this home, as product hotel, has to run his workers through some sort of emotional testing. Like in Blade Runner, because the emotions and home here are appropriate. So they've got to have so they've got to have it. So they've so they've got to have it. A test for communication product, in other words, for feeling, there has to be one here. In Blade Runner, they get subjected to fucking service and slave emotional tests. And that's what I'd like to do to you, darling. Subject you to an emotional test. I really want to know if you love me, you fucking android. All the robots Blade Runner gets tested for emotions. And this product test takes place in the future. Home can only be treated as a product here. If the client, that means me, can establish social relations with the cleaning staff. Like fucking you, for example, from the cleaning and whoring staff. And that's love. That's what they, <laughs> that's what they mean by this shit. This hotel sells love. This hotel sells shit. As soon as any whores turn up, the fucking concierge calls the police. And yet love is what this home hotel is producing. But only exclusive and heterosexually oriented. This hotel calls the police. And tests whether the employees in this hotel establish empathy. The boss of this hotel has a lot of conversations with his employees. <laughs> talking about their prospects and goals. And that's a lot of work! The fucking head of personnel has got a hell of a lot of work testing his staff's emotions. Whether they're real, this introductory chat now with the service personnel is a product test. Fucking emotional test. Boy comp test. Product test. Whether the staff are familiar with all the guests' idiosyncrasies. And you've got to know everything about the men who live here, uh, here who you're serving. Fucking men! I've got to know everything about the people in this fucking hotel, or else there just isn't any love of the fucking men in the hotel. And I can't sell the way I am or being real because I can't be real if I don't know what they want! If you don't know what the men want, you can't be real. In that case, I'd rather be. Between the guests and the employees, for example, the cleaning service. We're all women! An almost intimate relationship should arise. Self-effacing attraction is a key feature in the marketing. Shit. And it's also profitable because it produces social value for clients. This bimbo is excitedly dishing up fucking air. Blow dry your hair, you bad girl. All the service providers producing home here are shackled to their work the entire time they're at home. There's a towel in your head. You're always someone else. Yes, I am. And in the one room, I lie to my landlord, and in the other to my and in and in another to my boss, and in another, I tell the truth to someone I love, which is a fucking mistake. You shouldn't say that. Housing front 2004, and there's a neat little kitchen, and that's where you can take responsibility for certain tasks, and it provides you with a form of privacy. And that's a luxury. The, va the advantage vis-a-vis -vis luxury hotels is that here you can perform certain duties yourself in this home hotel, not the really shitty stuff, of course. And of course, you don't have to do the fucking work. And that is a luxury. Yeah, yeah, all right. Shut up! Oh, shit. <laughs> 
service offers a home. And the whole social side here is a service. The whole social side of this shithole is a service. And there you can find me every day in this hotel as a kind of service offered by the management and everyday practices which you can buy. The advantage over luxury hotels is that here you can do little things for yourself like making coffee. But that crap can be done by your hotel wife. I thought I was walking into a hotel, but certain places that one expects of a hotel weren't there anymore. Suddenly there's nothing left in here that I connect. Uh, suddenly there's nothing left here that I connect with the hotel. Like for example, a difference from home. This hotel produces an indecision at home, but I've got to live somewhere. This shit here has got to live somewhere. I or this shit has to have somewhere to live or work. I and the shit have got to work somewhere. This here, this shit has got to have some kind of socially respectable accommodation. Now say goodnight, but first I'm going to send out for pizza in my home hotel. Pronto. Pizza's coming home. This love hotel doesn't work anymore. It all disappears into that black hole called your brain. Has that ever happened to you? You were expecting a kiss and got a punch in the face instead? Not interested. I Hey. But how about it then? You're the one insourcing empathy here in this hotel! There's no soul in this hotel, but soul is supposed to be insourced here, now, by the cleaning staff and realizing an intimate relationship with them. Insourced soul, you fucking guess! Is your soul real? <laughs> you fucking! And I get these offers to be myself, but I don't want to be like this hotel wants me to be. I do not want to be like this hotel wants me to be. All these potential selves to offer. Be yourself, Norman Bates. <laughs> In this motel. Fuck neoliberalism keeps offering to let me be myself, but I don't want to be like that. What are these ways of living based on then? Purely on possibilities of a self that I'm not going to live, in which are all planned. All these possibilities of subjectivity exist when I'm not going to use. But there are contradictions there. I'd be living in relationships of a possible self that I'm not. There's this computer standing on your desk, now shoot it! I'm hunting androids, I'm not hunting computers. Shut up! Blade Runner, in this hotel you are hunting technology that behaves as if it is human, so shoot that computer! Let's talk about our problems, darling. Psycho Hotel. I wanted to find a home in conversation with one of the women from the cleaning service, but I'm so terribly boring. Of course, she listens to me and shit, but she'd actually far rather fall asleep there on my desk or on the bed. I'm just too boring. When I was in a restaurant once, the waiter fell asleep taking my order. Oh, I am sorry! Thankfully, while he was lying in a heap, he dreamed an order, and eventually the shit did arrive, and I was quite happy. But <laughs> that isn't a home hotel. A restaurant doesn't offer you a home. Okay, yeah, I just wanted to tell you something. I just wanted to achieve some kind of personal relationship. <laughs> Shut up! And then no one would serve me anymore, and there was sort of a waiter outsourcing. They just wouldn't serve me anymore. I'm so terribly boring. Once I was murdered in a home hotel by a population planner, and the only way the police could stay awake was by marking out the line round my body with cocaine. Fucking pigs! You got simply no respect for people, death, or boredom. Because you establish personal relationships with the staff through boredom. Mm -hmm. You're boring. And that means something. <laughs> there was this architect from Chicago, and somebody caught him putting women's clothes on his cock. Clothes for Barbies. He used them to fuck a doll's house through a hole in the floor or something like that. A fat Barbie doll doing kind of aerobics or step-ups in an earthquake, whose brain suddenly squirted all over the ceiling, something like that. What kind of a doll's house was it? It looked a bit like the one in Psycho. Was it an antique? You mean, did he fuck an antique? Possible. It's possible the doll's house was an antique. It's possible. Like a cock imagines Barbie. She looked a bit like Norman Bates's mother, a kind of drag queen from hell. And the horse was like the house was like Norman Bates's house or Bates Motel, and it had a car which could drive along and a horse box. That was kind of funny. <laughs> Ken was sitting on Skipper and actually wanted to go and play tennis with Barbie, only she was busy pleasuring herself with step ups, going blue in the face till her brain exploded. Who caught him? His aunt. It ended with Mrs. Janet Lee impersonated by a cock taking all of her clothes off. I can't take any more of this. <laughs> <laughs> How was the house furnished? In keeping with analyzed social trends. The cop was playing a single mother. A social category we're supposed to find their expression in their living space. Who designed the house? Ultra brutalist architects. They designed the house and then fucked it. <laughs> so where have the fucking aliens got to? I'm so hot for these fucking aliens and for blasting them away! I'm going to kill the lot of you, you damned robots. You fucking androids! This Blade Runner's plugged into some kind of a motion computer, or else she's taken hotel LSD. And that's so fucking aggressive. Right, yeah. They're just feelings that my fucking sensory organs are communicating to me. They're feelings that this home is communicating in this hotel. This science fiction thingy. 
I completely forgotten. They're not mine at all. I just like feeling that fucking. I just feel like that fucking computer. You're not actually that aggressive. No, I'm actually a really nice girl. You're actually really caring and all that shit. Yeah, right. But now I'm plugged into the science fiction emotion computer, so social categories are all irrelevant. Like male and female. That's all like irrelevant. And now I'm fucking aggressive. Yeah, cool. But no more differences than aggression. Actually, I'm really a nice girl! There are these wires on you stuck to your cheek and this emotion computer somehow makes you aggressive. That's great! So, so I'm not like that. This aggressive thing going around shouting, uh, this aggressive thing going around shouting isn't me after all. It's like, I'm going to kill you! All you damn replicants! Blade Runner, sweet. You're a cop. I'm not a cop. You're worse than a cop. You're a Blade Runner. All right. So I'm a fucking Blade Runner, but I'm not a cop. I've never killed a single living thing in my life. Not like a cop. I've only ever killed robots, so I can't be a cop. It's not what I am. And so if I do terminate these robots here, I'm just clearing away electronics that's pretending to be human. Electronics that's pretending to be human. Toasters that behave like humans. If this shit wouldn't keep on behaving so humanly, I wouldn't have to take it out. Everything that appears natural about this is the result of technology. Everything about these replicants that appears natural is the result of self-technology! Shit! I'm so artificial. And now, of course, they get tested for emotions and empathy. This technology is tested for emotions and empathy, and if it doesn't have any, it is destroyed. Emotions of self-technology. You destroy things. Yes, I do. And after all this time, I can still only afford electric sheep. Fuck it. And that's, and that's with talking to my employees every day and doing all these emotional tests. Science fiction hotel. But I want to be able to afford something real. I want a proper sheet, not some electronic crap like that one there. I want a real sheet. We are in the year 2525, and Kubrick just seems like yesterday. Good. I've fallen in love with someone who manufactures emotions, and they're real. Although my coping with them doesn't interfere with my work at all because they're created specifically to fit. Emotions and stuff, they don't really interfere with my work and that's great and all that shit, but I mean like being able to afford it, paying for emotions, that's why it mustn't ever interfere with my work. Otherwise I'm not able to afford all that shit. I just can't allow one of the hotel staff to destroy my life like Norman Bates, like someone that could destroy my life. I'm in this hotel and this crap gives the impression that I'm at home here and now I don't know anymore. Am I on drugs uh, or am I really at home in this factory that makes emotions? Am I at home in this business and do I want to be? Am I at home with this fucking love and this fucking business? How can I know? And the feelings that I'm confronted with are also real. These are all real feelings from the staff and the hotel and it's also real here feelings. They're maybe more real than they ever were before in this reality hotel. I'm in a fucking hotel. I love it so much. I love all the people and all the Albi people in this fucking hotel. I am so happy in this factory. I am so fucking happy in this factory, which creates empathy in my life. In my it makes me so happy that there are people here who are, who are paid to establish a personal relationship with me. That is bullshit that you're here, you fucking whore. And then I can find something like love with you. It's interesting that you're here. That's interesting that you're here. I probably couldn't take all this shit here and working in this home hotel if there wasn't this reality tested replicant dross here. If you weren't here, then none of it would be interesting anymore. There'd be nothing left. Nothing would be of interest anymore because there'd be nothing left. Shit. And that's why this shit here is still interesting. Because you're so interesting here, you whore! I believe in UFOs, and I'm not going to let anyone talk me out of it. I'm not going to let anyone tell me different. There's life out there. Don't anyone try to tell me different. Somewhere out there, there's life. Fucking hell, I know. Somewhere out there, there's life! Why do I suddenly feel so much? I'm not used to feeling this much. I don't know what to do with all this shit. And suddenly there are all these feeling chips and I've got to feel something all the time and show a real empathy with my clients. So long, why your clients full? And transplant these feeling chips. I've got absolutely... Feelings have got to go somewhere, so now they get planted inside robots. Otherwise, no one has any use for them. I, for example, have no use for feelings. You have to be a manager to hire the manager, sweet. I can just as well be a whore. I just mustn't look like shit. Otherwise, I'm no longer going to be compatible with the potential self on offer there. You, for example, are the only you, for example, are only a whore while you're visiting a manager lying in bed while he's busy finishing something at his desk. 
to the concierge, your coworker. This floor is a coworker in the range of possible identities offered to managers, and the gigolo is at home here in a pleasant atmosphere at this home hotel. Yes, I am. You're trying to make a living here in this disembodied factory, which manufactures a home, but you do that in the underground of this hotel as a standard pleasure model replicant. This hotel has an underground. Home has an underground here in this hotel. You work here, and your social space is arranged purely from a cop perspective. But if the gigolo, or co-worker, looks like a migrant, then that's reflected in his economic worth. This hotel produces feelings of safety. This porter, or Norman Bates, manufactures safety and order of feelings of safety and order. And it manufactures this threat scenario, which links crime and migrants together. And there are these illegal immigrant whores lying in your bed, and your hotel wants to deport them. The policy of the community outside has made deportation faster and simpler. And these illegal immigrant whores get deported quicker and quicker. Now there aren't any orgies of life in this home hotel! I'm not, I'm not, uh, I'm only used to normalizing behavior. I can't live an everyday life that's illegal! I'm not all you piece of shit! Your break with the society or within the society is treated with a policy of internal security and nothing else! Oh my god, this Blade Runner has fallen in love with an android! Science fiction hotel! The Blade Runner's fallen in love with an android that works as a standard pleasure model! And this android is your job, now do it! Do your job! That's what I do! You live in this popcorn hotel in the cinema. This popcorn is my hotel. This machine is creating my home! Your hotel is popcorn, and that's where you live among all the exploding cornfields. And that's your home! I live in an exploding popcorn hotel! <laughs> And the head of personnel, or Blade Runner, tests his employees' empathy. Yes, I do! And they are determined by algorithms. Empathy is determined by algorithms. Empathy is bureaucracy and scientific management. Interview popcorn! You've got to ask me, like you're really interested, whether I like it in this hotel. Do you like it here? Your interest has to be real because this is a service. Did you like it then? You fuck! Your interest has to be genuine, please! Please! You like being at home here, you piece of shit? All right, okay, but you're over 40 and you can't keep on being thrilled to serve everyone. Oh, yes, I can, and I am not 40. No, you can't. I am not 40, but I am thrilled. Serve up a thrill. <laughs> and now insource that shit. When you live somewhere, exclusivity has the highest status. In other words, this here. And as for you, you bum, all you do is hang around and sleep rough in things. That's got no status at all. This here, this hanging round outside, that's got no status at all. Hmm. You're lying round on this park bench or the swivel chair, and that has zero status. The division between inside and out is a part of economics, the highest status and given to a scrupulous division of inside and out between the public and domestic spheres. On the other hand, there is this unrestricted crusade for justice. The USA's justice knows no bounds, but globalization only works if there's also exclusivity. And if exclusivity and a scrupulous division between inside and out have the highest status, then crossing the divide has a direct effect on one's value. Behavior that is converted into economic value! If that shit outside now goes and crosses the dividing line, it will immediately affect its value. Yeah, now come and try and cross that line. Try crossing from one sphere to the other. <laughs> There's this concierge sitting in this office suite hotel. And she's watching to see that the division of inside and out is being respected, and she's got all these police duties. Detachment and exclusivity. That shit there! That shit here! There! Means for establishing norms. Exclusivity is linked with social status. Home is part of economics. And the porter is expected to do the police's job. But your porter is Norman Bates. Yeah, and he's expected to do the police's job! Where am I here? Which hotel is this? The porter arrested me. The fucker? And I live here. But I was standing around in this foilless home in my sweatshirt that I wear at home looking like a broken window pane. So somehow I looked like shit and my presence was translated into the economic value of a broken window pane. If you wear the wrong clothes, it's reflected in your economic worth. If I stand in front of my hotel dressed like I'm at home, I, it's like I smashed a window out there. If you hang around outside the hotel in a tracksuit, you might as well be smashing the windows. You've got a sweatshirt that breaks glass. Yeah, sure. I stood in front of the hotel in my cheap things and I looked like a broken window. This hotel is too beautiful for you. Yeah, the hotel is too beautiful for me! Yeah, but... Now the product testers in this hotel want to test whether the feelings in the home that are produced here are real. Test. <laughs> the Blade Runner is the tester, and he's looking for androids who are here illegally. The most brutal means of exclusion there is, is in your home hotel. I'm going to give my beloved husband a whore in this hotel, because then I hope he'll love me. Maybe the shit will love me again if I buy him something better than me. Maybe then the shit will love me again if something can be bought that's better than me. Fuck! 
I want to be loved again. I can't stand it. And now at least there's the empathy that people in this hotel have for me, the ones who work here, manufacturing empathy. Empathy? There is that, thank God, in this hotel. People who love me and who have been tested, whose love for me has been tested by Blade Runners. You're organizing your life illegally, you android, without a residence permit, for example. How am I supposed to automatically comply with social norms if you don't? You're working in this hotel illegally and manufacturing home underground. At least that's what I'm making to be here with you. How should I know? I can't take any more of this. Don't ever do it again. I can't go on. I just can't get the nerves anymore. But the only way to achieve home is as a norm. Okay, so there's this same-sex relationship between you and the concierge, but the working relationships remain heterosexual. Are there social conflicts in this hotel? No, this hotel's heterosexual and it's going to stay that way. But I can't fit the norm anymore if I love you. It's just not possible. At least not here with you underground. I used to be able to. Normatives were a fluid technology of power or instruction or command inside me that ensured I apply these norms to myself. But if I love your fluid technology of power, you then I no longer feel myself ethically bound by the law or any kind of preordained concept of security and order of life and any kind of consensus about how I should organize it all. So there are social conflicts in this home. No, I love that fluid self-technology in your mouth. Or is it like gas? Like someone said, is it the gas of some kind of disembodied factory manufacturing home? I don't know. I just can't breathe anymore when I'm near you. It's just... Too much like a fury for me. I love the fluid technology of power in your mouth, and I want to keep on swallowing it forever and ever. Or is it gas? Shit, shut up! Okay, tell me I'm beautiful, and then I'll feel at home. No way. I want to feel at home here, so tell me I'm beautiful! Okay, then you're beautiful, you fuckhead! And now I've got to test your empathy. Test the whores here for their empathy. No, I don't want to. You're a blade runner, and you judge yourself by the norms of this society. And now you're in love with this android. I'm lying here in the underground of this hotel, or at home, and I love you. And at the same time, there's this reflex either inside me or close to me, I don't know, that keeps judging me by the norms of this society. But what do I do then with what's left over? Because there's something left over which doesn't want to and won't accept those norms or feel morally bound by the law, darling. And that's what I want to be, and, and that wants to be loved too. You don't judge yourself by the accepted social norms. You I just don't want to make any fucking home with you. That's all. I want a home somewhere. I refuse to make a home in this hotel. You don't do that automatically like some program. Judging yourself by accepted moral norms. Thank God. No, I do not do that. Here next to you, there's something that keeps judging itself by norms and instructions. Me, this thing here. And all you judge yourself by is the illegality in which you organize your life. And that gives you an advantage. I'm trying to have some sort of life, but it's just a rough idea. It's not as like attractive as renting the manager suite. Here in this hotel, you get offered a possible self and the ability to organize it in the field of work. And the life I'm trying to have has a lower status there than what I'm being offered. So I try not to live that way at all or take up the offer, some potential identity that's on offer that has to do with love. Love converted into economic value. You can't buy yourself anything with that. But here in this hotel, love and empathy are converted into value. Okay, so you can trade it in, but you can't live it. All this trying to live. <laughs> I never get any offers of a crappy life, <laughs> but that's what I want. I want a shit life. I can't carry on living what hotels and other spaces in the city have to offer. That's not me, this city. This isn't a city. I can't help the feeling it's not me, this city, this prey. This here is isn't prey. That was so impossible and wonderful and complete. Under these conditions where love is a for-profit gas, I just can't live anymore. Or something like that. Or I don't want to in this hotel I'm living in. I don't want to make a home. Don't, don't make, make a home! home! So maybe let's have a short... Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> we thought they could be fun. Oh. oh, we thought they called the cops because we were screaming. What? We just thought they called the cops because oh, really? we were screaming. Okay, I'm gonna put my clothes on. That's what, well, yeah.
Sure. Yeah. yeah. Panel. <laughs> oh, really? yeah. This I still, you still have the mics. Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, that's good. Oh, it's good. good. Okay, okay. So, um, great, great. So. Let's put uh, the mics up a little bit. They're all nuts. It's all good. It's 8 30, right? So long for David. No, it was just a theater play. The police came. And... <laughs> uh, all good. Thank you. It's okay. It's okay. We're all good. She knows you're doing your job. Yeah. You're <laughs> 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 the trouble. <laughs> okay. Um, Could also be theater. She liked it. She said she enjoyed it. She liked it. Yeah. 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 She came for the noise and stayed for the play. That's a good sign. Yeah. So, um, so first of all, thank you for putting this together. I can't believe it's really in in two days. Is that true? Yeah. We so I think yeah. another round of applause. This was quite an. Um, maybe we go directly to the actors and say, well, how did it feel performing uh, this work that comes from a different time, from a different city? 2004 Zoomers. Yeah. Um, it was great. I, I mean, I, I, I love Polash. I've seen one of his plays. At the what did you see? Volkswagen. Kind of ended six shown um, in like 2015. And I just loved how irreverent it was. And that nothing really seems to make a ton of sense in the way it does when you're working on contemporary American naturalism, of course. Um, so I was thrilled to hear about this when the email was sent. And, um, you know, none of none of your, it felt in rehearsing this is like, oh, none of my training is supporting this. I'm freaking out. I'm such a failure. And it's like, that's sort of the point. That's sort of the point <laughs> is that like, it's not set up for that, right? It's post-traumatic theater. It's not, it's outside of, you know, which doesn't mean it's impossible. Next. Um, it was fabulous. I love new f or new old forms of theater, and I feel like it's just not something I've seen, ever been sort of um, lucky enough to experience. So it was really fun to um, dig new grooves out in my brain. I'm trying to think of something new to say that hasn't been said. <laughs> um, is, it, just... is it a line from the play or? <laughs> <laughs> Blow dry your hair, you bad girl. What to say? I can't think of what to say. I don't have anything to say. It was really fun to work on. <laughs> um, I studied Polish in my time in Germany, so it was really awesome to bring it to life. Um, we did like this one PowerPoint that was all things Polish, and I feel like I learned more in the two days here than like the two weeks prepping for that. Why did you study Polish in Germany? Tell them. Um, well, I was in a, a theater school in Germany for six months, and of course, Polish is one of the like main people to study with Brecht and um, Hans. <laughs> Which Hans? I know, right? <laughs> I don't remember the last name. <laughs> but um, <laughs> um, yeah, it was it was a fun time. We actually created a little dialogue scene with the yelling thing for the class because that was something that was new, um, and it was just some random words. But it's very interesting to see it in a full length play and how the device can work in many ways other than just what comes like what your first thought of it would be. Very good to be here. <laughs> okay. Um yeah the yelling is so fun and something that we don't get to like use the that device of so just yelling coming out of nowhere, like coming out of your body like a primal instinct um was really fun. And yeah, I just think generally playing with the language um, in this translation was great. Like kind of chasing after your partner um, and keeping up that pace is, is is exhausting, but it is really, it's really fun. It was like, we worked for like four hours in this room and I was like so tired. And then, but I felt so high because I was like, oh, this is like, you don't, you won't, you don't want to put it down because you're scared <laughs> to not be able to pick it back up. <laughs> So for you guys um, as directors, so um, tell us a bit of the process. Uh, you emailed me, <laughs> <laughs> and I thought it was an exciting prospect, and and um, 
I remember it took a couple, we got, Frank and I got, we got coffee, we talked about it, and I was excited, and then it took a second to track down the translations, and, you know, I, the, I read them, and I cast them within, it was like a 45 second process, and, and so at the t other end of the process, it was exciting to see the casting, including, in a sense, including David as another director, all of it made sense today, and I was, so that was exciting, like I, it was truly got impulse, and, and this is like our, some of our company, we, we all work together, um, David's been directing a series of readings um, at our, our space of new playwrights, which I now see you're tapping into full ash. Like the, the American playwrights, one of whom Stephen is here tonight. Um, I, I can see that the work that David's kind of curated at our, our space is in some ways informed, or I think indirectly informed by this. But I didn't get that until tonight. So that was cool to see. We've sort of accidentally formed like a, a reading series of which this seems like it's a capstone in some way. Um, but yeah, I, it started with, Kind of try. David and I have worked together on a uh, for two years now, and it just was a lot of trust, like a lot of seriously cigarettes and coffee, and and getting out in the sun a lot, and and really truly trying to have fun with it, but also like kind of back and forth between hyper intellectual and then just like let's yell and and talk and smoke, and and I think that that was my perspective on and, and trusting that the company can be really intellectual and then really relaxed and goofy, and then that we don't have to like be sort of insecure about approaching this play in a, in a spirit that it doesn't want to be approached in, that it doesn't want us to come in and say, now we're going to resurrect this legacy and all that. No, we just had to relax in the room and, and be friends. And that, that felt like the right way to approach it. And that's how we approached it. So. Um, yeah. I mean, I think that the, the plays that kind of drew me were always sort of plays that, that understood that trying to figure things out can be emotional or that philosophy can be emotional or like the process of trying to come and under, come to understand something can actually be emotional. And that there's a strain in that in American playwriting, but it tends not to get, it tends not to get produced. Uh, you know, and so then when I, and I was working on writers like that, but I couldn't really get them before I went to Berlin and then I got to folks and I was like, Oh, right. Okay. That, 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 that's actually it. Like the emotional content of ideas. You're like, you're doing these impossibly snaky runs through concepts that you're trying to figure out, but the results almost kind of illogical and poetic, but like hyper intellectualized. And then suddenly you're like, you know, and it was just this perfect marriage of these two things. I think working on these with these guys, um, I think, I mean, one of the things that's just about the scripts that's really hard is that even you know i mean as i learned german i realized that even berliners like german speakers can't necessarily follow what the characters are hallucinating because it is so poetic underneath so it's not like it's not like it's hyper lucid in german and then so you've got the second or third order thing that's happening which is one they're really written specifically for company members which is why they never get they never got restaged without those particular members for the most part. And then B, you know, so then you've got this highly idiomatic German, which is familiar enough for like Berliners to get a kick out of, but then you're trying to translate it into English and like the translation we were working with is translating into British English, which is itself. So it's this funny thing of like, it's like, it's like quadruple alienated. And I think in a certain way, you know, the challenge, which I think these guys, met in both casts was trying to take something that's essentially like a casual approach to hyper intellection um and and pulling it back into your own language or your own emotional idiom in some way um you know is like the really interesting thing but yeah it's a you know yeah yeah i don't think it would have worked if we hadn't my own plays and the plays that david has curated all have something of this quality of kind of emotional philosophy or philosophy philosophical emotion emotionalism they had this quality and i don't think it would have worked if we had put out a casting call and said like you know okay. seagull center we have two weeks it, it we in a sense translated the process and translated the culture that i think supports the supported these plays from what i understand and so we were able to kind of translate the whole room and if that it makes sense we, we translated a whole several months long years long kind of training process to do this so it wasn't as scary and in fact it was actually a lot of fun and it felt like the result of the work we've been doing by accident but that's why we're we were happy to do it i do remember yeah i do remember this i mean this, this thing that happened like 10 15 years ago where there was a german theater festival at the public like all these readings that frank was involved in all these readings by berlin playwrights and the german playwrights and it was done with the labyrinth theater company who were really like hardcore naturalists naturalists and i remember doing like i had like a 
two days of rehearsal um for a play by i don't even remember who and like there there are those block capitals in the script and they keep trying to build to it they see the block capital and they start getting angry like a page before so they can get a proper build and like it was literally a day spent being like no th this is like this is like this is like analytical cubism, right? Like you, you are the you are the thing holding the character together, and you spin, and people see the character from different angles, and sometimes it's loud, and sometimes it's not. But it's just like ding, 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 ding. Like you can't build. And they were like, okay, 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 right, yes, got it, got it, yes. And we had like one or two read, one or two you know reads just before we went on. They were like, great, you got it. You stop on a dime. You show a different aspect of yourself. No problem. The minute they got a public there at the public <laughs> um the whole thing just went to shit and it was like slow arcs and builds um but these aren't these kind of actors and this is this, this isn't the kind of Not anymore which was which was <laughs> oh, great so certainly what we saw as an ensemble you know which is so very very rare actors who know each other have collaborated together there's a, a spirit and uh, this is why we were lucky you know to have you here i just want to talk a little bit about renee's work um and his work came to the stages it was something new it was something people haven't heard before. He um, mixed uh, pop psychology language with kind of pop business language, market, commercial pseudo market language. Um, someone said a German philosopher, um, if you want to look um, for belief and spirituality, you look at the market, you know, you look at the business pages, the market will do it. The market, you know, you will get down, but you will get back up. It's not real. The market reacts irrational, like a god, you know. And in the feuilletons, it's all nobody believes in anything anymore. And um, and I think what he did, this mixture of um, on a high-speed airplane, which he took you through in a time when the city, as you said, went through changes, when um, a nation that was divided all of a sudden got together. Berlin was a $100, $200 apartment place all of a sudden now it's 500 a thousand now it's actually three thousand um so it was a complete um um, um question of identity um 70 to 80 percent of all jobs in east germany were gone um, people lost everything has millions of people out of work and then people discovering this that it was it was and he found a way um to um, express it he also makes a bit of fun is a lot of yelling so for you who don't know German theater, which is often there, very significant, important, philosophical, speak Thomas Bernhardt's and the and they also yell and there is quietness and uneasy. So it was also a fun he made out of this. What is a typical German theater? Because Sprechtheater, the spoken theater, is a trademark of German theater, where perhaps the body is a bit more significant in American, where. If, great dancing, great singing, work of actors, what they can do on stage. It's very hard for German actors, or, but I think um, the um, this technological speaking, which also Brecht developed a kind of a flat technical speeching, a distance from your emotion, um, what he preached. He says, you just report uh, uh, an accident, like a bicycle accident happened, his famous example was a car, you just show the policeman and the jury what happened. You don't have to be emotionally involved. Just show it, it's a dash teller, you demonstrate. So he made kind of fun of that without any reason the yelling. And you know, so, and, uh, but they were upset. You could feel, as we could feel tonight, the deep existential utterings, the disturbance, the questions about what is love, what's a home, what is work. And I think that, predicted the corona times in a way, you know, where all of a sudden everybody works at home and then it's the work, who are we are, but companies don't pay for your apartment, but you work from there, you know? So this kind of identity a question that came up and he did it in a beautiful way, in a Bhutto dance, he was influenced by John Jastron who couldn't be with us tonight. John Jastron came as a teacher and his Chang and Avoid Moon, this kind of uh, automatic writing, kind of borrows, William borrows, cut up pieces where you take, pieces of work you cut it up sentences and you collage them together but it has a rhythm it's like a music piece um, but what it was it was subversive it was against the Stadttheater, against the beautiful big pieces he did it in small spaces and um and i think he did an incredible uh, a job and this evening is to honor i know i speak way too much mm -hmm. but um i also want to say this really is to a, a new voice and it's so hard to be an artist it's so hard to create work 
and to do something really new, find your voice, original, and also being lucky enough to be successful. He would have gone under in Germany normally, but by chance, somehow it worked out in the Volksbühne. He might have been much more successful in New York, you know, from his way of writing. Um, and many New York artists would never get any work in Germany and the other, and great directors would never be able to work here because there is not the um, financial support of it. So he was a bit of a wanderer between the worlds. He was very much influenced by New York, by the idea, by the avant-garde and the also end. Also by American movies and by America, like the other, the other big thing he got from Jezrin was like how to treat pop lyrics as dialogue. Like if you liked a song, you could just bring it in and make it significant by speaking it, which is, yeah. Long sequences of pop songs, which he put in, where, where you listen. Now it was very fast, but it also gave some breaks. You sometimes did silences, but what you did in that short time is truly amazing. And I most probably the first reading since he did the place in Berlin. This was uh, tonight. Oh, well. So my question to the actors, and then we can also go to the audience. Did, how did you feel the themes? Do they resonate? It's now 20 years ago, but about, is that still something you feel is it from a light from the 10, 20 years ago that reached you, or do you feel it's contemporary? What is also to you guys? What do you guys feel? Well, I have the mic, so I guess I'll start. Um, which is that uh, I, I think, you know, if you if you are lucky enough to work in theater in New York, a lot of the time you're just doing you're doing like cold realism, right? And you're like it's like psychological realism and you're like, there's a reason that this person is being this way. Like they're frustrated. There's a whole narrative. Like I play a lot of addicts in New York theater. So it's like, she's upset. So she's doing drugs, you know, or whatever. And so it's like, it, it's really interesting to be in these plays because it's like being alive is frustrating for me, at least. I don't know about for anyone else, but, mm -hmm. uh, and like, I think that that isn't something that goes away, whether you're like, I'm mad because I'm because I hate the movie that I saw tonight and I'm outraged or I'm mad because like I can't pay for my apartment or I'm mad because like Daimler Chrysler is taking over. And why is everything capitalism? Or, like those themes feel really resonant because it's like those kinds of like they're not petty exactly, but they're like quotidian problems are the problems that we actually are mad about every day that make us like go do the drugs or whatever that the epic play is mm -hmm. about. So I really enjoy just getting to be like, fuck, Shiza. like just, just uh, time to cry. Like just because that's like what I get mad about every day. So it feels very eternal. Yeah, like our group definitely, we, half of our rehearsal time today was spent talking about things that like we, we wove in between the text and our lives. And I, I think, the I mean, I know from the outside, the actors were definitely making a lot of connections between their own lives and, like Claire was like, oh, I have so much negative self-talk. It's like, well, that's the whole play, you know, and I know t I don't want to put words, but but definitely being able to find a lot, the relatability was just there. Like the play forced us to, I know it forced them to to think how they could hook in and it happened really naturally, maybe scarily naturally, but in an, ex you know, it was exciting. Um, <laughs> yes, I think it, it feels very, it feels extremely present. It feels Sorry. extremely, um, all the themes of like d disorientation and mechanization and I it feels like it can be telegraphed and overlaid onto 2024 in a second we were talking about like what's the zoomer version of all this stuff and it's like there's so many themes right now about d just your your phone like they talk about hyperlinks on the internet that's just your fucking phone like it's the same thing it, it really feels like and especially with our dynamic and the company dynamic it really does feel like we're just kind of laying on top of what's already been there so yeah it doesn't feel old at all it feels like it could have been written yesterday yeah um i agree like the concepts are have just deepened from when they were present in 2004 like on and now in 2020 they're they're the same they're they're deeper i feel like i struggle with work from home every day <laughs> so it was yeah it was really working for me yeah, it's not like it's not like the trajectory has changed like this is like pre pre rework pre we work pre smartphones but obviously yeah. Yeah. yeah 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 um and matt today you said oh i'm gonna rehearse outside yeah, even so we said yeah, we have rooms here the theater why why <laughs> uh, so i could smoke yeah so they could smoke. Uh, I mean, I'm a former high school teacher, so I feel like being in classrooms just gets me. And I told them, I just, I see the light and I'm like, I, I just, it was a nice day. And I felt like there was no reason, for, 
it just it just felt like we could sit at a cafe table in Bryant Park and I don't know it was just a gut instinct I mean again we didn't I, I don't I didn't have time to have a, a plan mm -hmm. so it just felt like the noise and the pe and having people like selfieing and talking and all of that like big tourist groups coming and sitting next to us it felt like the the play is about well the I drew a little diagram on the script at the, the beginning of today and I said like it was like these are like they're like cells and they're being attacked by all these bacteria and you can see the cell walls are constantly breaking down and they're rebuilding the cell wall and they're constantly fighting off invaders and then the, it's like three cells and they're all mer like sometimes they're merging and they're breaking apart and somehow that made more sense being at a cafe table in Bryant Park where you like people are literally hemming you in and like jostling their way in and taking photographs of you and ordering food and a pigeon took Renee's half sandwich she said take it and it like literally took it um and so I think it just it didn't the play didn't require us that did happen I mean I actually have no idea how, what David did or how he approached it. We worked as a group yesterday, and then today we broke off into segments. And so I don't. Yesterday, yesterday yeah. Matt and I co-directed everything, both readings at our theater, theater space in Brooklyn. Yeah. yeah. So and I think that worked well, but but yeah, I, I think that just the way I, I wanted some sunlight and I wanted to feel good, and, and that fed the, nourished the play circadian rhythm. Good, and we got the approval of our chief security officer, which has never happened in all those decades here of the Siegel. If they, they let us in out, yeah, wanted to say something, you know, that's amazing. Maybe we'll um, um and this is uh, uh, people with cell phones, um, yeah. So um, some comment or a quote or something, yeah. Um, First of all, thank you for this tour de force, true tour de force in terms of the yeah. acting. Uh, it is probably to me one of the most depressing visions of what contemporary life uh, with a cell phone, with a smartphone, which I don't have, refuse to have. And I'm in the blessed state of retirement and being old, I don't need it anymore. I never needed it. But anyway, what I want to say is I felt it from a structural point of view, it felt as though these characters are talking to their computers more than anything else and or to their cell phones, which that's why I said it's prescient because I watch people in the subway and they scroll, 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 scroll. And I look over the shoulder what they are scrolling and they don't really look at it anymore. And it is a mishmash of stuff. And obviously, and you get the sense, there's no connection there, and yet it's needed. They don't look at other people. I, I, I look at what people are looking at and what they're seeing. And it is, as I said, it's to me, and this is what comes out to me as the, one of the most depressing things it's the Zoom society. But I do think in, you know, if you see like the way that, I mean, what's interesting about the plays is that there, it's very much like when, like when he, as he staged them, there was always like a great sense of solidarity, you know, about a solidarity amongst the people. Like they're, they're all sitting there together, trying to build a concept that will adequately describe the situation and they keep failing, but there is a sense of like working together to do it. And during COVID, when people were on Zoom and they were in these little squares yeah. in their own little spheres, mm -hmm. and you could feel there is a longing to be to this is why you get the screen. Mm -hmm. And people do scream in their devices on their phones, no one is there, and people there's a deep hysteria, and people are deeply think, upset. But some other comment or or question. Um there's kind of a Reishian kind of thing happening. Uh, with a, but and then there's the release of the screaming. Yes, and that's an event. And so it, it, the, and, and making the theater out of dialogue, of course, you didn't originate that, but you did something with dialogue that um, I've never heard before. But uh, then it's, uh, it's, all, it, it's also a safety valve too, isn't it? Because we're allowed to scream like in therapy and and living theater and things like that. There's a safety valve places that really set uh, the system um, 
the, the system survives it, or fact, in fact, uh, um, in a way, um, be, it's a defense of the system. It, but it's so it's a release, and it's a great, it's a great, um, it's a great, it's a great um, satisfaction. I talk about frustration. Well, there's two. It wasn't. It wouldn't be fr if, it, if if screaming wouldn't be so satisfying if if life wasn't frustrating. Uh, whether because it's life or because it's the system we're under, we can talk about one that. thing so I noticed about the scream. Comment. One thing I noticed about the scream working on it this time that I never actually like actually working on the script is that it almost always arises from the same thing, which is like you realize your own complicity and that you like it. And that you like there's there's always like these screams almost always come out about the fact that like I hate this system and yet I'm fucking participating in it and I thought I was getting out of the system but I'm still in it and it's almost always that is almost always what drives there's this line in um a friend of mine's stage directions uh, that Stephen noted at some point which is like this this guy Jordan Gordon Dahlquist wrote in a stage direction note the phrase exactly what I wanted is most often spoken with regret. <laughs> <laughs> and it's but it's always that impulse of like fuck i'm trapped again um the other thing i would actually just about the scream that it really reminds me of is um this american comedian who died years ago named sam kennison um who would just do this stand-up and he would get so frustrated with everything that he would just he would just start screaming like and it was that, it was that kind of release yeah i mean I, I think these are interesting comments like the the play is way closer to our time than it is to the the depth psychology of the 60s or to the theater of the 60s, which in hindsight seems way more optimistic about people's ability to release and to form communities. And um, clearly by around 2000, 2005, the sense of, of dystopia had started to sit in, set in and, and artists, are, their job is to register that 10 or 15 or 20 years or 50 years in advance. Um, and maybe not in the same way, but the, like Dostoevsky wrote Demons and then Russia had a revolution 40 years later. And there's some... There, there are these amazing things with great writers where they do that. They just kind of get a hold of something in the wind and re working on these plays today, not to be too grandiose about it, but there was a sense of, it, it is a little eerie. And I know for some of the young, I'm 35. So this, some, you know, I was alive for this. But some of the people on the cast were like four. <laughs> and so this really is like reading a science fiction work um, about our present. It's, it, and, and there really is a sense that, and maybe because of you, Berlin's unique kind of situation on the historical map, it, it was, Polesh was in a place to really register these things. And, and Berlin was a city that could register these, the, the kind of influx of capitalism, which it was already normal here. But yeah, the lack of optimism, the feeling that connection is already impossible, the sense that we're just these vectors for discourse and for, for techno speak. Um, it's exactly how I think we should think about the present. And, it, and it's frankly amazing that we were getting warning signs. Um, and I think it would be very alien to someone from the 60s, for instance. I think it would be very alien to, to someone even 30 years before. But it's not alien to us. So. But it was, I just want to say, it was intensely communal. Like, uh, the funny thing about it is, like, all this despair. I mean, that's, Maybe that's the answer, yeah. All this despair in the moment at Prater was experienced intensely communally. Like, those, those screams are your screams. Everybody's having a good time with it. Um, I mean, I feel that way about our company and the plays we do often, which feature people on phones. I know Renee's in a scene in a, in a play of mine called Zoomers where the kind of the most like, iconic moment is where the two characters go on TikTok for like two minutes on stage. Um, and that's the thing that many, many people talk to me about is nothing I wrote, but just it says they go on TikTok and they, they just went on TikTok. And that really affect that people were, that, that freaked me out because that's something ever, that's so normal. But when you see people doing it on stage, it's really not normal. But it's true that afterwards, those moments, that's about as good as my life gets, is the you the life, I like doing this because it is the only possible way I found to, you can't tell people to not be on their phones, you, we can't arrest the, but there's spaces are carved out afterwards that feel like community because you've been able to represent it and at least acknowledge it and not repress it. Maybe it's not primal scream therapy or depth psychology, but it's at least an acknowledgement of the pain that, yeah, yeah. Hatred. Yeah, the doom scroll is doom scroll. Yeah, that's what they're calling it. What you spoke to beautifully is doom scrolling. Yeah, let's. Uh... Acceleration. Yeah, but we don't have the mic. Let's let me. They will hear. So anybody? Uh, okay. Comment. Yeah. 
if I may ask you, I know you're a director in India, you're working on a trilogy on, you know, the Hindu Muslim problems and about, you know, staging trials, tribunals, um, you just, you know, came from the Kunstan Festival. How does it look to you? Have you seen his work? Do you know about Rene? Um, yes, I'm, I'm fairly familiar with his work. And actually, uh, my question was the question that you asked with, which was, uh, what is the resonance? Uh, because I understand it and I know it from its very specific German context. And I was curious, but you already asked the question about... What does it mean to you? Um, I mean, I, I suppose this question of, uh, and I was, I'm, I'm just listening to, to, to you speak because, I mean, of course, one travels across the world, and so, you know, um, there are contexts that are very familiar and very similar, but also entirely different. And in the context of this uh, this play, I was really trying to think what what resonated uh, these plays. What resonates is actually how one feels caught in history. You know, that's what I was thinking about. Uh, is that how does one experience history? You know, currents that are beyond oneself, but also one is continually a part of. Um, and that's what I was thinking about is, you know, which I think is captured really well, uh, is just this, the being buffeted by history. And it certainly, it feels like that's very much a part of the moment that we all currently exist in, no matter where we are, whether one is in Europe, whether one is certainly in India, or whether one is here. And I think very acutely here, uh, because I studied in the States many years ago, um, and I come very often. But this time, I I really felt, for the first time, uh, this, a similarity of experience that I, I do feel normally in India, that you're caught in the middle of... Yeah. They have, they've all been read there. Uh, because of the Goethe Institute, of course, and translations, uh, there's a lot of uh, reading and production of German uh, playwrights up and uh, into the very contemporary. Good. So maybe um, we come slowly to an end. You know, again, um, it, 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 I think he did uh, predict um, um, the um, schizophrenic uh, identity crisis of our time, like the Uber driver is here himself is he an independent contractor or does he belong to the company he does it at home it's his own car and, and so many uh, many other things and i think but it helps us to understand to try meaning to see struggle to hear the cries and also in some some world of is very funny etc it's always very serious existential and i think it really helps us to um uh, to see we are not alone in what we do and it's a, a joyful, uh, in a way, sharing of the sufferings of the world. And with also a, a, a big uh, under statement, I think there are no ideologies. There's nothing that really helps us. We have to make sense out of it. And we have to live in contradictions. Nothing will get us out. But we have to find a way to say this and that, to scream and to make fun. So we have to find a way to do it. And theater is at least one way, I think, to, for a moment, hold everything together and things are OK in that communal experience. And it helps us to um, to uh, to connect. Maybe for the company and for both of you, what's up in your uh, future projects? What are you doing? A, a play of mine called Morning Journal, which a bunch of these folks are in, um, and that's running tomorrow, sun, Saturday, Sunday. Um, there's another play of mine tonight in the East Village. Things, things, uh, yeah, a lot of stuff on our website, the the Brooklyn Center for Theater Research. But yeah, we I have a new play that's going to be running through the end of June at minimum. So yeah, and a new translation of Uncle Von. We're located in Greenpoint, Brooklyn, and um, we, yes, we have plays and rep in the whole company. Yeah. Doing, yeah, George is, we're going to do an Uncle Vanya in our space. And a lot, I mean, I'm probably forgetting a whole lot of things we have planned, but we're, we're, we're doing, we're on somewhat of a repertory cycle, much like the Volkspunnel was, is that, you know, we're, plays don't necessarily close. The Brooklyn Center for Theater. theater the research. repertory theater, like the Volkspunnel in a loft in Berlin. Yeah, so we I just debuted a new play yes. from a new playwright, but yeah. 
Children's Center for Theater Research. Yeah. Well, David, what's up in your work and your life? Um, I just closed a holographic movie with a script that was at the at the um, Museum of the Moving Image with a script that was very that was very Polish influenced, actually, just in terms of that's true. Just yeah. a voice, just yeah. desperately like the first German I actually ever learned. I now realized was like that night at the Volksbühne because I just kept being like, "Ich bin desorientiert," and that really like disoriented. I mean, that is the state. Um, so I just finished that, and now I'm now I'm working on a very intense production of Strauss's Salome, uh, which is the exact opposite of Polish uh, for for uh, the Crossing the Line Festival in twenty twenty fall of twenty twenty five or Salome. Um, so we'll see. Uh, yeah, look for look for it a year and a half from now. Uh, yeah. Wonderful. Wonderful. No, th thank you. Yeah. So, so thank you. Thank you, Frank. No, this thank you, Frank. For, uh, for joining and for coming and a stunning, uh, truly stunning, stunning reading. One of the best readings I think we had in our long history of seeing. We have many great ones, but this is a great one. Thanks to Nyusha up there um, for uh, being help us with howl round and the sound and putting everything. And thank you all for coming and taping, taking time out. And we have a little reception, a little bit of glass of wine if you want to share and you can talk to the to the company members. And uh, really, thank yeah, you thank all. You, thank thank, you, to, the thank you to the actors, really, for... Yeah, and uh, uh, thank you all. That's exhausting. That was...